author bio, Wei Wei, Wei Wei, asterisk, Wei Wei, 1920-2008, was a prominent Chinese writer, journalist, and war correspondent, best known for his literary work during the Korean War. Born in Hubei province, Wei Wei became involved in journalism and literary work during the War of Resistance against Japan, 1937-1945, where he first developed his style of combining reportage with vivid storytelling. His writing often emphasized the heroism, selflessness, and moral fortitude of Chinese soldiers, resonating deeply with the patriotic and socialist values of the time. After the establishment of the People's Republic of China in 1949, Wei Wei continued to write, but it was his experience as a correspondent with the Chinese People's Volunteer Army during the Korean War, 1950-1953, that defined his most famous work, Who Are the Most Lovable People? His essays captured the spirit of the Chinese soldiers in Korea and helped shape the image of the revolutionary hero in Chinese literature. Wei Wei's works became highly influential during the 1950s, reinforcing the Chinese Communist Party's narrative of sacrifice, unity, and resilience. Historical context of who are the most lovable people? Asterisk. Who are the most lovable people? Asterisk was written in 1951 during the Korean War, a conflict between North and South Korea that involved major global powers. China entered the war in support of North Korea, viewing it as a struggle against Western imperialism, particularly the United States. For China, the Korean War was not just a defense of its neighbor but also a safeguard for its newly established socialist government. Wei Wei's essay was written during his time embedded with the Chinese forces in Korea. It reflects the idealistic vision of Chinese soldiers as selfless heroes, fighting not just for their country but also for international solidarity with Korea. The essay became an important piece of Chinese literature, symbolizing the patriotic and revolutionary spirit of the time, and reinforcing the ideological narrative of unity between socialist nations against Western powers. I have many dear old comrades, and they all feel tied to my heart. At any moment, they might smile faintly and appear before my eyes. This year, ever since the outbreak of the Korean War, the comrade I miss the most is my old Korean comrade, Old Jin. Yeah. When I open the newspaper and see the People's Army of Korea advancing fiercely towards Busan, it feels as though I can see him riding a horse, leading a troop, advancing steadily and proudly. Sometimes, it's as if I see him in the frontline trenches, seriously holding binoculars, contemplating the dense fortifications in front of him. But when I read about the U.S. invaders landing at Incheon, it feels like I can see him, old Jin, now thinner, darker, struggling to command his troops as they retreat with difficulty. Especially when I read about the U.S. invaders dropping thousands of tons of incendiary bombs on Korea, it feels like I see old Jin and his troops fighting and shouting amidst the boundless flames. Old Jin, my comrade. Now, as I read the letter you sent me this summer, and look at the small knife you left behind years ago, I think of you even more. The knife is covered in thick red rust, reminding me of those hard days, and of you. Part 2 In late spring of 1942, we were in the midst of a tough campaign against an enemy sweep. One day, after walking all night to escape an encirclement, we finally reached our camp, a small mountain village with just two households and a sheep pen halfway up a slope. I was so tired that I quickly fell asleep, not knowing if I was resting on a comrade's leg or shoulder. When I woke up, my stomach was rumbling with hunger. I went outside and saw that the cookhouse wasn't even smoking yet. At that time, I was really young and naive. I was small in stature and young in age. Although I had been promoted to be the youth officer, most comrades still called me Little Devil, and calling me Little Lee was already quite polite. Being hot-tempered, I got angry at the situation and rushed into the cookhouse, blurting out, Quartermaster, do you call this being responsible? The quartermaster, who was contemplating a bag of millet with difficulty, was startled and got angry too. Why am I not being responsible? You tell me, why haven't you started cooking or even lit the fire by now? You haven't investigated and you're just being subjective, he concluded, and then indignantly, he continued, as soon as we arrived, the villagers said that the Japanese burned the rice and dumped what was left of the pickled vegetables into the latrine. I hurried to Little Zhang village, but the warehouse chief had already been killed by the Japanese and no one knew where the food was hidden. It's 20 li round trip and my feet haven't even touched the ground yet, and now you. 
he was getting more and more worked up. Fire. Who do you expect to light the fire? Two of our four cooks ran away into the hills during the night and haven't returned yet. There's no well here, and the river is too lie away. The remaining cooks just hauled up half a tank of water. I don't know where you've been napping, but now you're coming in here to make a scene. Embarrassed, and with my anger subsiding, I weakly asked, So, what should we do? What should we do? Whether it's enough or not, it is what it is. He hefted the small bag of millet again and said, Little Lee, if you were the quartermaster, let's see what brilliant plan you'd have. We both just stood there staring at each other in silence. At that moment, two cooks came in, struggling as they carried a large bucket of water. Panting, they excitedly said, Quartermaster, we've got an idea. The quartermaster kept his head down while I hurriedly asked, I heard someone calling me. I looked up and saw old Jin leaving the troop, hurrying back toward me. He reached me, felt my head, and said, How are you, little Lee? The party secretary asked me to stay and take care of you. Old Jin, I called out. In such a situation, hearing his voice moved me deeply. I said, you should go. I, I don't want to hold you back. He helped me sit up and gently said, don't get emotional, comrade. You're burning up like a furnace, but I'm not sick, so it's fine. After thinking for a moment, he said, I'll help you to a villager's house to rest. If there's trouble, it'll be easier to handle. Saying that, he supported me as we walked towards a small village on the hillside. My head was burning like it was on fire, and I leaned against his shoulder, swaying as we walked. As we reached the edge of the village, we saw the villagers in a state of panic, some pulling donkeys, others carrying children or holding bundles, all rushing towards the ravine. An elderly woman with white hair grabbed us and said, Oh, comrades, you need to leave quickly. The enemy is not far away. Old Jin asked a few questions, then, after a moment of thought, decided to head for the most dangerous spot on Mount Motion. The enemy had never ventured up there. By this time, it had already grown dark. I was still leaning on his shoulder, but how could two people walk side by side on such a steep, winding path? Every few steps, either I would fall or he would, and sometimes we both tumbled to the ground together. When I insisted on walking on my own, he refused, fearing I might fall into the dark, ominous gorge. Finally, he untied his leg wraps, fastened them to my belt, and led me like that. As we walked, I focused on the sight of his white backpack and the clinking sound of his battered canteen. After walking for only about ten lai, I felt as if we'd walked over a hundred. It seemed as if a stream of icy water was beginning to flow down my spine. Oh, I knew that my malaria was attacking again. Soon, I started shivering. I couldn't stand anymore and sat down on the ground. Old Jin hurried back to help me, but no matter what, I couldn't get up. In a haze, I felt Old Jin cradle me in his arms and heard him calling, Little Lee, Little Lee, is the malaria back? I managed a weak, mm, he said, then let's rest here for a while. With that, he sat down beside me. Just then, a burst of machine gun fire suddenly echoed from the hilltop above. Da 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 da! The sound reverberated through the valley. I jolted awake, my mind clearing slightly. Old Jin swiftly pulled out his Mauser pistol and glanced towards the hilltop. Then, leaning close to my ear, he whispered softly, The enemy is here. At such a critical moment, comrades, you can imagine, how could I let Old Jin, a healthy man, sacrifice himself because of a sick person like me? I clung tightly to Old Jin's neck and, facing him, used every bit of strength left in me to plead with him quietly. Dear Old Jin, dear comrade... I will never forget you, my good comrade. I beg you, let me go. Just leave me a grenade. Under the starlight, I saw old Jin's face, more serious than I'd ever seen it before. Almost angrily, he said, Nonsense. Then, without saying another word, he sheathed his Mauser, stood up, and lifted me onto his back again. I don't know where his energy and strength came from, but it seemed to shake his entire body as he carried me onward, proudly striding back along the path. Even though I was drifting in and out of consciousness, I could sense beneath me the firm and steady steps he took. At a bend in the mountain path, I don't know if his foot slipped or if he tripped on a rock, but we suddenly fell. I was still on top of him, and in a panic, I quickly rolled to the side and saw that his head had struck a sharp stone. I called out to him softly, but he didn't respond, only gasping heavily. I touched his head and face. They were sticky, and his hair was wet. I knew he was bleeding. I fumbled around and found a first aid kit. 
As I was bandaging him, he let out a groan and woke up. He immediately called out, Little lie! Little lie! What solution do you have? As they poured water into the pot, they said, Comrade Jin and the messenger just came back with two large baskets of wild vegetables. The quartermaster and I rushed outside, taking a few hurried steps. We saw old Jin and the messenger, each carrying a large basket, struggling as they climbed out of the gully towards the village. It was clear that old Jin in particular could hardly walk anymore. We shouted and ran down to them. Old Jin's face had turned dark and grimy from days without washing, and sweat beads hung on his chin. Their shoes were worn out, with their toes exposed and wrapped in cloth, stained with purplish-red scabs. We hurriedly took the two baskets off their steaming backs. Wow! The baskets were filled to the brim with wild vegetables, wild leeks, young sprouts, crow tendons, and watercress, all lush and green as if their tiny green eyes were looking at us. We looked at the wild vegetables, then at the two of them, smiling. The quartermaster grasped old Jin's hand, unable to find the right words. Old Jin, out of breath, had eyes that were faintly smiling. We placed the two baskets of wild vegetables in the courtyard, and everyone gathered around, smiling as they looked at the vegetables and at the two of them. The messenger's face was flushed red, his bright eyes gleaming as he panted. Comrade Jin is truly remarkable. As soon as we got here, he asked around with the villagers and then called me to go with him. He pointed to the dense mountain peak across from us and said, We climbed all the way up there. Comrade Jin used a small knife and I used my fingers and we started a little competition. Comrade Jin even broke his knife in the rush. Saying this, he raised a small shiny knife. I took it and indeed the knife had two notches in it. The messenger continued, but Comrade Jin's elimination battle was thorough. He even dug out the wild vegetables growing between the rocks. He climbed up a cliff, and if I hadn't grabbed him, he would have fallen off. Well, old Jin solved the problem. Let's get the fire going. My stomach has been protesting for ages. Time for a feast, comrades. I'll light the fire. I'll pick the vegetables. Everyone was shouting, and we all got to work. Old Jin grabbed a handful of wild vegetables, Das sat down by the wall, and started picking them with his worn-out shoes stretched out in front of him. Before long, the comrades gathered around the steaming pot of vegetable porridge, eating ravenously with makeshift chopsticks made from branches and grass stems. No one could describe just how delicious it was. At that time, Red Poplar, who now writes poetry, was serving with us as an officer. He even wrote a poem about it. Who says wild vegetables are bitter? I say wild vegetables are sweet. They grow on barren hills, unafraid of desolation or cold dew, they thrive even between the rocks. Who says wild vegetables are bitter? I say wild vegetables are sweet. They grow on the high mountains, unafraid of fierce storms overnight. They bloom when the stars fade and the sun rises. Korean comrades climb the mountain. Wild vegetables follow them to the front. After eating, they sing loudly. Everyone says the wild vegetables are sweet. That very night, the party assigned me a task. I was to train old Jin to join the party. Now, the small knife covered in thick red rust forgotten in my satchel is the same knife old Jin used to dig wild vegetables. Part 3. After months of continuous campaigns against enemy sweeps, my body had been worn down. I had a severe case of malaria and had also developed night blindness. Once, we were surrounded by the enemy in the mountains for an entire day without a single bite of food or a drop of water. At dusk, the troops broke through the siege. But when, when we descended the mountain, I collapsed by a small river, too weak to stand. The troops rushed past me. I knew I had no chance of keeping up with the unit. I stretched my head over the clear river water and drank desperately, hoping to regain just a little strength in case of an emergency. Stop drinking. Lily, I'm right beside you, I said. Did I hurt you when we fell? Despite his own injuries, he was still concerned about me. I felt a lump in my throat and managed to reply softly. After I finished bandaging him, he sat up, fumbling to pick up the Mauser pistol he had dropped, wiped it off on his clothes, and said, I don't think the enemy noticed us just now. But, he pointed to the three stars in the sky, Look, it's almost midnight, we won't get far tonight. We might as well find a good hiding spot. If the enemy comes, we'll fight it out. He sought my opinion. Little Lee, what do you think? 
I nodded in agreement. He stood up, ready to carry me again, but I firmly refused. He had no choice but to lead me along using the strap tied to my belt. We turned into a narrower mountain gorge. As we walked, he kept feeling for his Mauser, pulling it out every now and then before tucking it back into his waist. After a few more turns and a bit more walking, he suddenly stopped and excitedly pointed ahead. Little Lee, look. I squinted and saw a dark shadow. It was a cave. He crouched down, holding his pistol out in front of him, and crawled inside, feeling around. What a great spot! What a great spot! He shouted from within. Little Lee, open your pack. There's a flat rock here. I untied my pack and crawled into the cave as well. It was pitch black and I couldn't see a thing. But after feeling around, I realized it was about the size of a small room. He took my blanket and spread it out for me. He seemed to have completely forgotten his own injuries as he patted my leg and said, What are you waiting for? Sleep. We need to be ready for whatever happens tomorrow. He helped me lie down and then sat by the entrance, leaning against the rock wall. As my malaria chills passed, the fever returned and I slowly slipped into unconsciousness. At first, I could still hear the sound of him fiddling with the hand grenade, but after that, I lost awareness. Whenever I hazily opened my eyes, I seemed to see a grand and majestic figure. A man, his head bandaged, gripping a hand grenade, sitting at the entrance, eyes fixed outside, guarding me. I felt like a baby, sleeping peacefully in a mother's arms. In my heart, I wanted to say, Old Jin, you should rest. But I didn't know if I actually said it. I was completely delirious from the fever. When I finally woke up, daylight had arrived. The cave felt empty. I was the only one left. I looked down and saw that I was still holding a hand grenade. I looked around the stone walls and noticed a patch of fur-like material on the ground, as if something had once slept there. This must be a wolf's den, I thought, feeling even more alone and anxious. Where has old Jin gone? Unable to bear it, I crawled to the entrance and looked outside. The mountain peaks were covered in thick grass, swaying and whistling in the wind. There was nothing in sight. At that moment, I longed to see even the smallest sign of a comrade, to hear even the faintest sound of a comrade's voice, especially old Jin's presence and voice. After a long while, I finally saw someone descending from the mountaintop. Against the bright blue sky, I could clearly make him out. He was wearing a white bandage on his head and carrying a bundle, limping as he walked. I recognized him immediately. It was old Jin. I waved at him, nearly shouting out loud. As he came closer, I noticed he was now only wearing one shoe, the other foot bare, bloodied from the jagged rocks. Yet, for some reason, he was brimming with excitement. As soon as he saw me, he smiled and said, Little Lai, were you getting anxious? I pulled him into the cave, nearly embracing him. Looking at his face, his square yellow face, now darker and thinner, with higher cheekbones and sunken eyes, I saw that his deep-set eyes still sparkled with a constant smile. When I asked where he had been, he seemed not to hear me, too busy unwrapping the small handkerchief he carried. Inside were over ten golden yellow pieces of steamed pumpkin. He quickly said, eat, eat, and then finally answered my question. Didn't I tell you? No, you didn't, I replied. He laughed again. Ah, you must have been delirious from the fever. I stayed by your side until just before dawn. I was worried the enemy might search the mountains at daylight, so I went to scout the situation. I woke you up in case anything happened and gave you a hand grenade just in case. He handed me another piece of pumpkin and took one for himself, but I noticed he only took small bites. He continued, On my way back, I thought about finding something for you to eat. And guess what? I ran into the old lady from yesterday in a hollow of the mountain. She gave me all this steamed pumpkin and even asked about you. Eat, little Lee. I ate several pieces of steamed pumpkin, feeling a bit more energized. I didn't want to finish them all, fearing they wouldn't be enough, but he saw through me and handed me another piece. When I asked about the enemy, he seemed to be hiding something, saying only, Eat, don't worry about that. I pressed him, and only then did he tell me. The enemy's tents covered the surrounding mountaintops, and the village below was filled with lanterns and torches, bustling with noise. Most notably, the houses hadn't been burned, a sure sign that the enemy hadn't yet retreated. All this pointed to one thing. The enemy was definitely going to search the mountains today. Old Jin, I said with a heavy heart, 
As long as I have a hand grenade, just one, I'll fight to the end, wherever I am. I'll preserve my national dignity. It's a pity that I'm burdening you. Hearing this, old Jin's eyes immediately turned serious. With dissatisfaction, he said, I completely disagree with you. How is this a burden? Don't forget, I may be Korean, but I, old Jin, am willing to sacrifice for a comrade for the Chinese people. And no matter where I die, in any mountain or by any village in China, I will have no regrets. His emotions surged as he continued. Little Lee, I don't know how you see me. But I believe that if I live to see your liberation and my own country's liberation, and if I can become a Communist Party member, that would be my greatest happiness. Such solemn words left us both silent for a while. Outside the cave, the wind howled, rustling the mountain grass, and a light rain began to fall. Old Jin, you've been up all night. Let's lie down together and warm up a bit. He agreed. As he untied his grenade pouch, I noticed something written on the handle of one grenade. I picked it up, and on the golden wooden handle were the words, Spill the last drop of blood for the liberation of the world proletariat. I felt as if a great surge of warmth swept through me, and I immediately thought of the task the party secretary had assigned me. Old Jin, I called out, embracing him. Looking at his bandaged head and his thin, dark face, I said, I'm willing to be your recommender for joining the party. Old Jin embraced me in return. Even though the world outside the wolf's den was gloomy, with the mountain grass swaying in the wind and rain constantly assaulting us, we felt nothing but warmth. In my heart, a song quietly hummed. In these difficult days, dear friend, please tell me, what is the most precious thing in this world? Hash 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 part four. In the autumn of 1943, after I was transferred to another region, I lost contact with old Jin. It wasn't until the liberation of Zhang Jiaku that I heard he had returned to his liberated homeland. This August, I finally received a letter from him. The messenger also mentioned that he was now a division commander in the Korean People's Army, and that his division had been performing quite well. The letter read, Dear old comrade, asterisk, it has been six or seven years since we last saw each other. During all this time, I have never forgotten you or many of our Chinese comrades. Even in the first few years after I returned to Korea, I would often dream about our old landlords in the mountain valleys. I even thought that after our victory, I would go back and visit those places. Comrade, how have you been these past few years? Have you gotten married? Are you a father now? I know nothing about these things. Since my return to Korea, I have continued to work in the army. I spent several years in a regiment, and last year, I was transferred to a division. I often think that the reason I can now bear such responsibilities for my country and the Korean people is inseparable from the great struggle we once fought together. Without that experience, wouldn't I still be a small laborer in South Korea, driven by the whip? This is something I will never forget for the rest of my life. The unfortunate news I must share is that my mother and my eldest child, 14 years old, were killed in a US bombing raid last month, and we couldn't even find their bodies. My sister joined the army and once charged at an enemy tank, blowing it up with a grenade, but two days ago, she too was killed in an assault. Now I have only my four-year-old daughter, who is being raised by her mother in the countryside, and my wife has also joined the fight against the Americans. Comrade, many villages in my homeland, just like the ones we fought in together in the Bayou region, have been nearly burned to the ground. This is the achievement of the Wall Street robbers on my land. Old comrade, please don't be saddened. Steel and fire can never make the people of a nation submit. They can only ignite an even fiercer, more resilient fight. We will continue to fight with even greater courage and wisdom. Trust me, old comrade, I did not fear Japanese imperialism in the past, and I will never fear the American bandits now. We will ultimately defeat them, driving every last one of them off our land. My eyes, old Jin's eyes, will never allow a wild beast to squat on my homeland. The liberation of the Korean people will certainly be achieved in the end. Because of the constant fighting, I cannot write much more. My last hope is that you will write to me and tell me about yourself and our old comrades. Even here on the front line, I often think of you all. Dash dash dash. Hash 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 part 5. Now, sitting in front of me is this letter and a small knife covered in red rust. They remind me of the hardships we endured together, interwoven with the flames of the Korean battlefield. Old Jin, my comrade who shared in those hardships and trials. I miss you, I cannot forget, 
in the difficult days of the Chinese people's struggle, who was it that climbed the cliffs to gather wild vegetables, who held, supported, and carried me out of the shadow of death in the darkness, who, with a white bandage wrapped around his head, sat guard over me with a grenade. Most importantly, who taught me the meaning of the most precious thing in this world. Old Jin, my comrade through hardship and adversity, please wait for me, soon, the Yalu River will witness your old comrade standing shoulder to shoulder with you in the places lit by the fires of battle. December 15, 1950, Beijing. Dash dash dash. Hash 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 fire and fire. In Korea, if you had never been to the country before, you would never be able to see what it once looked like. So many towns and villages have been reduced to scorched earth, mixed with snow, by the indiscriminate bombing of enemy planes. The hard-working Korean people, who built and lived in these places for generations, whose children sang and danced here, are now only remembered by a name left on military maps. But what I must tell you is that this has not instilled fear or sorrow in the Korean people, but something else. Something that stands tall on every piece of land in Korea, as unyielding as the endless mountain peaks, and its name is hatred. One snowy night, we arrived in Weichen. It used to be a bustling city. Now, amidst the snow-covered ruins, only a solitary clock tower and a few broken walls remained. Despite this, enemy planes still bomb it several times a day, and I really don't know what they are bombing at this point. We had no choice but to find a place to rest in a nearby mountain ravine. This, home, was a temporary shelter that the people of Weichen had dug into the mountainside, a pit covered with branches and straw. Here, Part 5. Now, sitting in front of me is this letter and a small knife covered in red rust. They remind me of the hardships we endured together, interwoven with the flames of the Korean battlefield. Old Jin, my comrade who shared in those hardships and trials. I miss you, I cannot forget, in the difficult days of the Chinese people's struggle, who was it that climbed the cliffs to gather wild vegetables, who held, supported, and carried me out of the shadow of death in the darkness, who, with a white bandage wrapped around his head, sat guard over me with a grenade. Most importantly, who taught me the meaning of the most precious thing in this world. Old Jin, my comrade through hardship and adversity, please wait for me, soon, the Yalu River will witness your old comrade standing shoulder to shoulder with you in the places lit by the fires of battle. December 15, 1950, Beijing. Fire and fire. In Korea, if you had never been to the country before, you would never be able to see what it once looked like. So many towns and villages have been reduced to scorched earth, mixed with snow, by the indiscriminate bombing of enemy planes. The hard-working Korean people, who built and lived in these places for generations, whose children sang and danced here, are now only remembered by a name left on military maps. But what I must tell you is that this has not instilled fear or sorrow in the Korean people, but something else. Something that stands tall on every piece of land in Korea, as unyielding as the endless mountain peaks, and its name is hatred. One snowy night, we arrived in Weichen. It used to be a bustling city. Now, amidst the snow-covered ruins, only a solitary clock tower and a few broken walls remained. Despite this, enemy planes still bomb it several times a day, and I really don't know what they are bombing at this point. We had no choice but to find a place to rest in a nearby mountain ravine. This, home, was a temporary shelter that the people of Weichen had dug into the mountainside, a pit covered with branches and straw. Here, we met a boy named Lu Bingli. Though only 13 years old, he sat beside us in silence, like an adult. He told us that before the war, his father was a worker, and he was a student at a nearby middle school. Back then, he dreamed of studying hard and becoming a useful person, so he could help build his country into one without poverty but his school was bombed, and he lost his chance to study. Then his home was bombed as well. On the day it was destroyed, he saw more than 30 bodies scattered around him for the first time. When he spoke of this, his eyes blazed with fire. He said angrily, they destroyed our cities and villages, even bombing little children who can't speak. I want to kill them all, every last one of them. Pointing toward the ruins of Weichen, he said, look, isn't that my home? We looked again at the uneven piles of dirt and the lone clock tower. When asked about his future, he unhesitatingly replied, I want to be a soldier in the people's army. But we told him, you're too young. He lowered his head in frustration. Hatred had matured this 13-year-old boy, and the look in his eyes, so deep and resolute, made it hard for us to believe he was just a child. In a small village called Jingu near Sunchen, about 20 li north, I met an old woman who was 70 years old. 
That night, she sat with her grandson in her arms, keeping watch over us, carefully covering us with our coats when they slipped off. When we woke the next morning, she was still sitting there, watching over us like a mother. She wore a white dress and skirt, her hair completely white. I asked if she had any other family. The old woman drew closer to me, her eyes filled with pain. She told me that her 27-year-old son had been killed by the American bandits. They found him in a ravine, already beaten to the point where his eyes couldn't even move, and then they stoned him to death. With her frail hands, she gestured the scene of her son's tragic death. She recalled and repeated how her son had been such a bright, kind, and cheerful man, loved and admired by everyone in the village. Their family had once lived so happily, but now, only she, her daughter-in-law, and her mute grandchild remained. As she told this, the old woman leaned forward, grasping both my hands tightly and shouting, Children! My children, you must catch the murderers who killed my son. Kill them, tear them apart. She seemed afraid we wouldn't hear her clearly, so she held onto everyone's hands, patting their chests as she repeated her plea. Her tear-filled eyes, though dry and aged, seemed to glow with fire. I knew these were not ordinary tears, they were drops of hatred. Near Pyongyang, I met a Korean journalist. His hand was bandaged from a bomb injury, and his boots were marked with bullet holes. During the retreat, he traveled with the people, trekking 1,700 li on foot over 25 days, being surrounded 20 times, each time breaking through. When we asked about his family, he said he had a lovely young wife and two children. His wife was a famous singer in Korea, but to this day, he still didn't know what had become of them. Though his voice was filled with pain, he smiled as he told us. He added, we worked so hard for five years, only to have it all destroyed by the enemy bombs. Now I have only a gun, a pen, and a notebook. I no longer think about my home, my wife, or my children. There's only one thing in my heart, revenge and victory. This was the voice of an intellectual from Korea, a voice filled with both suffering and a fierce will for justice. On the Korean battlefield, the foolish enemy thought that with their iron and fire, they could conquer this nation clothed in white. But they didn't know that every bomb they dropped and every drop of blood that dripped from their shrapnel only turned into boundless hatred. The flames of hatred in the hearts of the Korean people burned far stronger than the incendiary bombs of the invaders. It was this fire that pushed every soldier in the People's Army and the Volunteer Army to advance fearlessly, even in the face of death. It was this fire that drove countless Korean women and elders, in their thin clothes and straw sandals, to repair roads and transport supplies in the icy snow, supporting the army and defeating the American invaders. It was this fire that compelled thousands upon thousands of Korean mothers to send their sons to the front lines. I saw with my own eyes, in Wonsan, a mother who had already sent two sons to the army pointed to her 16-year-old son and 18-year-old daughter, determined to send them both to join the People's Army as well. It is this fire, this fire that will not stop burning until it consumes every last one of the invading beasts. This is no small spark. This is an all-encompassing fire, a raging, unstoppable fire that no force can extinguish. January 14, 1951, sent from somewhere in Central Korea. Fairy tales from the front line. Here, I want to record two real stories that seem like fairy tales. The Volunteer Army. On January 17, we stayed in a small mountain village 20 li north of Suncheon, called Jinguli. The hosts were a Korean mother and her daughter. They sat with us, playfully tending to a two-month-old baby, chatting warmly. The daughter was holding a very cute baby, plump, with big, curious eyes that kept glancing around at everyone, smiling sweetly. I couldn't help but take him into my arms, and naturally, the conversation turned to this little life. The Korean mother became emotional, pointing at the baby and looking at us, sighing repeatedly. The child's sister and mother took turns excitedly telling the following story. When the American invaders launched their frenzied assault to the north, it was just six days after her brother was born. They carried the baby 70 Lee to a relative's home. Shortly after they arrived, they were suddenly attacked by enemy planes. Rushing to the nearest air raid shelter, they realized in their panic that they had left the baby behind. The sister wanted to go back to find him, but her mother, seeing the house and its surroundings already engulfed in flames, refused to let her go. At that moment, a few Chinese People's Volunteer Army soldiers arrived. After hearing their situation, they immediately ran toward the burning house. The building next to the baby's room had already been destroyed, with flames still flickering. 
The soldiers rushed into the room, where the baby, having kicked off his blanket, was crying on the mat, completely naked. One soldier quickly unbuttoned his jacket, wrapped the baby in his arms, and carried him back through the smoke and flames, handing him to his mother and sister. Before they could even express their gratitude, the soldier hurriedly left. After telling the story, the Korean girl took the baby from my arms, smiled at him, kissed him, and said, when you grow up, I will be the first to tell you how your life was saved. Everyone's eyes focused on the baby. The Korean mother sighed, comrades, the Chinese People's Volunteer Army is the second parent of this child. One comrade asked, what's the child's name? He doesn't have one yet, replied the Korean mother. Then call him, Volunteer Army, someone suggested. The Korean girl smiled and looked to her mother for approval. The Korean mother nodded solemnly. By this time, the baby had fallen asleep in his sister's arms, a sweet smile lingering on his face. Catching Sparrows In Dongduchan, Bochan County, South Korea, there was a 13-year-old boy named Kim Shusun. He quickly became close friends with a Chinese People's Volunteer Army soldier surnamed Liu, just like the friendships between countless children and Liberation Army soldiers back in our homeland. One day, the soldier fell ill with stomach pains. The boy quickly ran to his mother to ask for stomach medicine. His mother told him that roasted sparrows dipped in sesame salt were an excellent home remedy. The boy, like a busy little horse, rushed from neighbor to neighbor, borrowing a stool here, climbing up to eaves there, and by dusk, had caught four chirping sparrows. He was overjoyed. His mother prepared the sparrows, and the boy happily brought him to the soldier. Comrade Lu looked at the dish for a long time before realizing they were roasted sparrows. He didn't know whether to laugh or cry. With his stomach in pain, how could he eat something that mischievous kids usually catch just for fun? The boy, seeing that his friend wasn't eating, tried explaining, but to no avail. Frustrated and on the verge of tears, he finally forced the soldier to eat the sparrows. Strangely enough, after completing what he saw as an important mission, the boy returned to his mother, beaming with pride. Unexpectedly, the peculiar remedy actually worked, and the soldier's stomachache disappeared. The next day, as the troops prepared to set out for battle, the soldier wanted to find his young friend to thank him and say goodbye. But the boy arrived first, bringing another three roasted sparrows. The soldier shook his head, pointing to his stomach, indicating that the pain was gone. But the boy gestured again, as if to say, now that your stomach is better, let's eat him together. He pulled the soldier close, and like lovers sharing an apple, they ate the sparrows together. Afterward, they sang a song together, the song of General Kim Il-sung. January 22, 1951, written in a location in Korea. In the Wind and Snow. Part 1. I heard this story while the front lines of the Han River were fiercely engaged in battle. Heavy snow was falling, and teams of the volunteer army were heading to the front. The comrades were in a hurry, but no one noticed a 12 or 13 year old Korean girl closely following behind them. When the unit stopped, the girl somehow slipped unnoticed into the headquarters of a machine gun company. When the comrades saw her, they wondered, where did this little girl come from? She wore only a thin shirt and pants, a dirty white skirt, and a pair of thin rubber shoes, already worn out. Her hair was a tangled mess, with bits of grass stuck in it, and upon closer inspection, a scar from a bomb fragment was visible on her neck. She clutched each comrade's hand, holding it for a while before moving to the next. But since the liaison officer wasn't there, no one could understand what she was saying or where she had come from. When the liaison officer finally arrived, everyone learned her story. She was a child who had lost her home. She had been wandering for two or three hundred li, spending one night here and another night there, finding food wherever she could. That night, she had crawled into a haystack to sleep when she saw the volunteer army passing by and decided to follow them. Upon hearing this, the comrades scrambled to wash her face, serve her food, and arrange a place for her to sleep. But the next day, the girl didn't want to leave. She told the company commander, Uncle, I want to go with you. The company commander smiled and asked, Little girl, why would you want to come with us? I can't do much, but I can boil water and serve food, can't I? At home, I help my mom cook, but we're going to be fighting soon. The little girl bravely replied, Fighting? What's there to fear? I may not be able to fight, but I can still watch. I'll be so happy watching you kill the American devils. But think about it, comrades. How could the volunteer army bring a little girl to the front lines? But they couldn't leave her behind either, knowing she had no one to care for her. 
What could they do? The company commander went to consult with the political officer. Eventually, they came up with a solution. They arranged for the host family to take her in. The host agreed, and after much persuasion, they managed to convince the little girl to stay with the family. But who would have guessed? In the middle of the night, the girl came running back to headquarters. She said the host had locked her in a cold room and threatened to kill her once the army left. It turned out the host was a landlord. The village had only three households, and the other two were unoccupied. The company commander and the political officer were at a loss. The next day, the battalion commander called, instructing them to prepare for battle that night. This only added to their worry. The company commander frowned deeply, and the veins on the political officer's forehead bulged. They had never been so troubled, even in the most critical battles. But the little girl kept asking, Good uncle, you promised me. When are we leaving? She pointed to the heavy machine gun and imitated its sound, do do do, do do do. Let's kill those, me guo essay la me, American soldiers. This really left the company commander and the instructor both at a loss for words. The company commander looked at his watch. It was ticking away briskly, as if it were running. Part 2. The company commander had no choice but to call the battalion for instructions. The instructor seemed to think for a while on the phone before finally answering, regarding this North Korean girl, don't worry. Take good care of her. I'll personally come over and handle the situation shortly. Sure enough, after a while, the battalion instructor arrived. The battalion instructor was a tall young man, very kind and lovable. The company commander, the instructor, and the soldiers all rushed to salute him. The little girl, being so clever, even mimicked everyone else and gave a hand salute. The room was packed with people. The instructor pointed at the little girl and asked, is this the girl you were talking about? The company commander nodded and said, yes, it's her. She insists on coming with us. The little girl could tell they were talking about her, so she ran to the instructor's side. Like a child seeing their mother, she rested her messy head on the instructor's knee, clutching his belt with her small hands. She then raised her head, pointed to the wound on her neck, and looked up at the instructor with her big eyes. She started telling how she was injured by American planes, how she escaped from her burning house, how she found her father lying outside the barn with the grass meant for the cattle scattered to the side. She shook him, but her father didn't respond, he had been killed by the bomb. She then found her mother in the kitchen, probably washing rice, with rice spilled all over the floor. She shook her mother, but she didn't respond either. Her mother was no longer with her. She went to check on her brother, who was still holding onto a piece of rope he had been weaving, but his face was covered in blood. She went to her sister-in-law, who had been sewing a new outfit for her, but she too was lying motionless on the ground. And just like that, this little girl's once happy family was reduced to just her. The little girl cried for a while in front of her parents, then for her brother and sister-in-law, before finally wiping away her tears and walking out. When the interpreter, also a Korean, translated this to everyone, big tears rolled down his cheeks. Everyone lowered their heads. The instructor's eyes were also misty, but he fought back the tears. With a heavy sigh, he suppressed his emotions. The little girl lifted her face again, looking up at the instructor with her big eyes, and pleaded, Uncle, please let me stay with you. I want revenge. I can learn anything. I even know how to sing Chinese songs. If you don't believe me, I'll sing one for you. She glanced around the room and began singing. The east is red, the sun is rising, China has brought forth a Mao Zedong. As she sang, the instructor suddenly scooped her up in his arms. For some reason, the instructor's tears started falling uncontrollably. At that moment, all the volunteer soldiers in the room started crying too. Some turned away to wipe their tears, and there was even the sound of someone blowing their nose. Comrades, the instructor asked solemnly, do you think this child is lovable? Who could say otherwise? The instructor continued, yes, she is indeed lovable, just like the millions of children in our homeland. But look how much suffering the enemy has caused her. If the American robbers were to invade our homeland, what would happen to our beloved children? Everyone listened quietly. In their minds, the children of their homeland, in cities and villages, wearing red scarves or not, appeared before them, vibrant and full of life, like endless rows of crops in the fields. Everyone's eyes were wide open as they stared at the instructor. The instructor continued, but comrades, we will never let the children of our homeland suffer like this little girl. And we will make sure this little girl and the millions of Korean children live happily, just like our own children. Do you agree? 
Yes, everyone answered in unison. Good, comrades, that's what we are fighting for. Tonight, we will begin the battle. Have you cleaned your machine guns? Yes, we have, and the mortars, also cleaned. Good, comrades, when we fight, fight fiercely. The fiercer, the better. Let those beasts' bodies pile up into mountains, and let rivers of their blood flow before our positions. But what about the little girl? The company commander interjected. The instructor replied, You've taken good care of her, and I commend you for that. As for this little girl, let her come with me. I'll figure something out. With that, he took the girl's hand and stood up. Seeing that the instructor was going to take her, the little girl was so happy she began jumping up and down. Her face beamed with joy, and she said, Good uncle, let's go. I'll follow you to the ends of the earth if I have to. Part 3 The mountain road was covered with snow, and white whirlwinds were blowing everywhere. The cold was biting. The instructor took off his coat and draped it over the girl. At first, she refused to wear it, but when the instructor pretended to be angry, she finally put it on. The coat dragged on the ground as she walked, but she was truly happy. If there had been others on the road, she would have proudly said, Look, I'm a volunteer soldier now too. They arrived at the battalion headquarters, where the battalion commander and the deputy battalion commander were both present. The instructor introduced the little girl, and she hurriedly ran over to shake hands. The deputy commander, with his sharp eyes, immediately noticed the wound on her neck and shouted, Messenger! What are you doing? Hurry and find a medic to treat the child. The instructor asked if the battle preparations were complete, and the battalion commander confirmed that everything was ready. The instructor smiled with relief and said, How shall we welcome our little guest? The battalion commander patted the little girl's head and burst into hearty laughter, Little girl, you're lucky. I just bought a little chicken to give us strength for the battle, and now you're here, let's say it's in your honor. The medic washed the girl's wound and applied medicine, and the messenger brought in the meal. The chicken had been cooked, steaming hot. The little girl was too shy to eat, taking only tiny bites, which made the battalion commander laugh heartily again. Hey, no need to be so polite. A soldier needs to be able to eat, walk, and fight. Here, he picked up a plump chicken leg, dripping with oil, and placed it in her bowl. How could the little girl express the joy in her heart today? After the meal, it was getting late. A messenger from the regiment brought the orders. The troops were to move out at 8 p.m. The battalion commander quietly whispered to the instructor, What are we going to do, old Lou? What's your plan? The instructor whispered back, I've already sent the deputy instructor to arrange things. It turned out that before coming to the machine gun company, the instructor had asked the deputy instructor to place her with a nearby local family. While everyone was chatting and laughing, suddenly, a buzzing sound filled the air. Enemy planes were coming, circling over the village. The little girl bravely stood up, shouting, Uncle, get down, get down. But the volunteer soldiers, having grown accustomed to fighting American planes, didn't flinch. Seeing no one move, she ran over and forced him to lie down. How much she loved the volunteer soldiers. When the American planes had finally left, the deputy instructor returned, followed by several local Korean civilians. Among them was a bent-over old man with a white beard and an elderly Korean woman holding a small cotton jacket. The deputy instructor excitedly exclaimed as he entered, Instructor, it's done, several families are fighting over who gets to take in the little girl. As he spoke, he patted the little girl on the head and tugged at her tiny hand. The elderly Korean woman quickly rushed forward to put the small jacket on the girl, while the old man with the white beard gestured eagerly, saying, No, no, comrade, let her come with me. Seeing this, the little girl hurriedly ran to the instructor's side, on the verge of tears, and said, Uncle, didn't you promise I could go with you? Why are you sending me away now? The instructor and the battalion commander, both anxious, said, good child. We're about to go into battle. But I came here to get revenge. This left everyone around them in a difficult position. No one had expected this little girl to be so determined. What were they to do? At that moment, they suddenly heard a woman's voice from outside. Is this the battalion headquarters? Then a young woman entered, her hair cut short, wearing a uniform, and carrying a satchel. She said, comrades of the volunteer army, I am from this area. The female cadre from the Women's Alliance continued, I'm here to help you gather supplies. The battalion commander burst into loud laughter and said, perfect timing. We've already gathered the supplies. 
Now, why don't you handle this situation instead? With that, he left to prepare for the departure. After understanding the situation, the female cadre picked up the little girl and affectionately kissed her, gently explaining, all right, you want revenge. Then come work with us. The instructor took this opportunity to say, yes, working with them is also a way to fight the American devils. Then, pretending to be stern, he added, if you don't listen, I won't talk to you the next time I see you. At this, the little girl finally said softly, okay, I'll listen to you, uncle. But I still want to go fight with you someday. At that moment, the sharp and loud sound of the assembly bugle rang out. The troops were gathering to set off. The little girl ran up to the battalion commander, the instructor, and many of the soldiers, shaking hands with each of them. Even after the unit had gone far, she stood on a high hill, shouting with her clear, bright voice, Goodbye, uncle. Goodbye, uncle. June 1951. 1. In Korean, American, refers to Americans. 2. In the context of Korea, Myon is equivalent to a district in China. The battle on the south bank of the Han River. The battle on the south bank of the Han River was fierce. In the motherland, it was already spring, but here everything still bore the face of winter. The wide, winding Han River was still covered with silver ice and snow. On both sides of the river, the mountains remained silver, and the drifting clouds were misty and white. Only the pine trees in the hills and valleys provided dark patches of black, this was the natural scenery of the Han River front line. The enemy was stationed only 15 kilometers from Seoul and even closer to the Han River. The American invaders' commanders could already see Seoul through their binoculars, and if they started their jeeps, they could reach it in less than 20 minutes. But instead of taking 20 minutes, they used over 9 divisions, 20 days, and the blood of more than 11,000 criminals to stain the snow-covered mountains with red. And yet, the Seoul they saw through their binoculars was no closer than it had been 20 days before. Why was this? Why was it that this notorious imperialist force, with over 200,000 troops, couldn't advance even 10 kilometers in more than 20 days? Was their artillery insufficient? No, their artillery was fearsome indeed. They could reduce a mountaintop from white snow to black snow, from old soil to new soil, and from a forest of pine trees to a field of corn stalks, leaving pine branches scattered across the ground. If they could pour all the world's steel onto a single position in an hour, they wouldn't hesitate. But still, they couldn't move forward. Was it because they didn't have enough planes? Or because their coordination with ground forces was poor? Again, no. They ruled the skies, and their coordination with ground forces wasn't bad. They could freely drop heavy bombs and incendiary bombs on our forward positions and nearby villages, setting everything ablaze, turning even the lush grass-covered mountains black. Could they advance then? Still no. Was it because they weren't attacking fiercely enough? Definitely not. Generally, when their first wave of assaults was repelled, their second wave was not delayed. Initially, they attacked two or three times a day, but later increased this to five or six times, and then seven or eight, or even over ten times a day. Despite their own dead clogging the roads of their assault, they continued to send waves of fire and flesh against our beachhead positions. Eventually, their assaults were no longer counted. In some areas, where we were low on ammunition, they pressed the South Korean forces to engage us in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and after we pushed them back, they stayed just 50 meters from our positions, building fortifications to fight us closely. Their planes and artillery bombarded us day and night, regardless of weather. At night, they set up networks of flares and searchlights. And finally, they even deployed poison gas. You see, they used everything they had except atomic bombs. They left no stone unturned in their attacks. Could anyone say their attacks weren't fierce? But did they manage to advance? No. Why was that? The reason was simple. Before them, on the small beachhead on the south bank of the Han River, lay one of the world's most courageous armies, armed with Mao Zedong's thought and superior tactical skills, heroes of the highest caliber. Of course, the fighting was intense and grueling. It wasn't, as some might think, as easy as picking a bouquet of flowers in a garden or meadow. Every inch of ground here was fought over repeatedly. The soldiers here had lips cracked from thirst, ears deafened by explosions, and eyes bloodshot from sleepless nights. Yet they swallowed dry roasted flour, chewed snow, and kept their gaze fixed forward through the swelling smoke, their bloodshot eyes unblinking. Here, regimental and divisional commanders sometimes had to roll up their maps in burning houses and move to another room to continue planning. Here, the telephone operators repaired lines dozens of times each day, under constant shelling. 
and when ammunition ran out, they used damaged rifles, bayonets, and stones to drive back the enemy. One night, I arrived at a small room that served as a regimental command post. A map was spread out on a small Korean-style table, lit by a single candle. Outside, planes droned overhead. The deputy division commander, the regimental commander, and the political commissar were all studying the map. After finalizing their plans, the deputy division commander, a middle-aged soldier, opened his silver cigarette case and offered each of us a cigarette. Just as we lit our cigarettes from the candle, two loud explosions suddenly rocked the room, knocking the candle to the floor and extinguishing it. The rain cover over the window fell down as well, and the light from the flares outside shone through like a full moon. But no one moved. The regimental commander picked up the candle, relit it, and the political commissar brushed the dirt off the map. The guardsmen reattached the rain cover over the window. We lit our cigarettes once again. The regimental commander, as if seeking confirmation, smiled and looked at the deputy division commander. Deputy commander, would you say our troops are holding up well? The deputy commander hesitated for a moment, then said quietly, yes, we are experiencing a type of war we've never gone through before. We, no, he corrected himself, pointing at the bold red line drawn on the map, everyone here is being put to the test. He paused, then flicked away some ash and smiled. But in my view, it's precisely this test that is truly revealing the strength of our troops. On the most intense day of the battle, I overheard the division's political commissar, his beard long unshaved, and his eyes red from exhaustion, talking on the phone. Each time he called his subordinates, he always began with, comrades. You must be tired, right? Without waiting for a response, he would immediately say, I know you're tired. Then his voice would become grave and firm, make sure the comrades understand the significance of holding this position. Our defense is to tie down the enemy so that our forces on the eastern front can destroy them. We will not engage in pointless defense or consumption of resources. We all know we must hold out until the right moment. He would pause, then add, also, remind the comrades, what kind of victory is it if we can only win because of planes and artillery? In the history of revolutions, the counter-revolutionaries always had better weapons than us, yet they were the ones who failed, not us. Even if we surpass them in this regard, if the balance dips even slightly, they will cease to exist. Today, our weapons may be inferior to theirs, but under these conditions, we will still defeat them. That is our strength. He would seem ready to hang up the phone, then quickly add, our motherland will know how we achieved this victory. On the battlefield, the soldiers fought with the same heroic determination as the political commissar. Here, I want to recount a story of two soldiers holding the line. One of them was named Sin Ju Si, and I personally interviewed him. I quickly realized he was a clever young man who could understand a whole sentence just by hearing half. He was only 20 years old, from Heilongjiang province, and had been a member of the Communist Party for two years. He was now a squad deputy leader. Like many other soldiers, after the battles abroad, the knees and crotch of his pants were patched multiple times, but he had sewn him neatly. Standing there, he looked handsome and endearing. One evening, after returning from a counterattack on the enemy at the outpost, he saw many of his comrades still in their defensive positions, poised as if ready to throw grenades or fire, but they had all sacrificed their lives. Only soldier Wang Zhicheng remained, focused, crouched in his trench, quietly looking downward. His expression was calm, and he only fired a shot every few moments. The enemy had no idea how many people were still there and dared not advance. Sin Jiu Si quietly crawled over to Wang Zhicheng and asked, Do you still have any ammunition? Wang Zhicheng pointed to the last two bullets and humorously whispered, Only these two brothers left. How about you? Sin Jiu Si made a circle with his thumb and index finger, indicating he had none. By then, it was already dark. The enemy's whistles echoed across the mountains. Their artillery had begun extending its barrage further. From the rear, foreign voices could be heard, indicating the company's main forces had retreated. Wang Zhicheng said, Deputy squad leader, the main force has pulled back. Why haven't we received any orders? Sin Ju Si replied, Yes, why no orders? But without command, we can't retreat. We promised our squad leader that as long as one person remained, we would hold the position. With two of us, how could we abandon it? Wang Zhicheng nodded and said, Of course. I made up my mind long ago. Our good comrades have already sacrificed for the motherland. If we die, what does it matter? Sin Jiu Si immediately corrected him, 
What do you mean, die? If the sky falls, we all hold it up together. If we need to cross the river, there will be a raft. If the enemy comes, we'll hit them with stones and roll down the slope. Those cowards won't find us. That's how I rolled down earlier. At this point, Wang Zhicheng suddenly remembered something and said, Deputy squad leader, we should hurry and crouch in two different positions. If a shell hits one of us, the other can still hold the line. With that, the two of them crouched into separate positions. Xin Jiuxi poked his head out to encourage him, Wang Zhicheng. Hold on tight, and you'll be rewarded when we get back. Wang Zhicheng smiled in the starlight and nodded. They stayed composed, not panicking, occasionally glancing forward and listening to the sounds behind them. By now, the enemy's artillery had pushed further beyond their position. All around, the enemy forces were making noise, and the area had become like an isolated island in the middle of the sea. Yet, the enemy still dared not advance onto this position that had dealt them such heavy blows. Hours passed. The night grew colder, and frost covered their bodies and guns, forcing them to stomp their feet to keep warm. Wang Zhicheng called out again, Deputy Squad Leader. It's awfully quiet here, let's eat some roasted flour before we get too hungry. All right, Xin Jiuxi replied. The two opened their flour bags, and with the wind howling around them, they took a bite and quickly covered their mouths to keep the flour from blowing away. It wasn't until the messenger came through the knee-deep snow to fetch them that they followed the North Star's guidance and slipped past the enemy to return. When Xin Jiuxi finished telling me this story, he looked at me with the bright, clear eyes unique to young people and added, since going abroad, even non-party members have been determined and have asked to join the party after making contributions. I'm already a party member, so what is there to fear? If the war reaches the northeast, reaches our homeland, his eyes darken like clouds forming in the sky, and he pointed to an elderly North Korean woman nearby, carrying a child and searching through the remains of a burnt house. Won't our parents be just like her? You don't know, I'm not the type to cry. I believe it's shameful for a man to shed tears. When I was a child, my mother sold me to someone else, and she cried like a fountain, but I didn't shed a single tear. But this time, when I came to Korea and saw how the American devils were tormenting the Korean people, I cried. Now, it's already spring but the Korean people haven't been able to plant their crops. What will they eat in the future? If the American devils invade our homeland, bombing and burning like this, our country is so large, and our villages are so densely populated. The soldiers fought with such indomitable spirits, holding their positions with unshakable determination. This is why, even though the enemy had superior firepower and air support, they were bound to lose in the face of such warriors. Additionally, it must be emphasized that despite the heavy artillery fire from the enemy, their casualties were always far greater than ours. Let me give you an example of an unremarkable company. This company, precisely because of its lackluster reputation, was often ridiculed by some of the younger soldiers in other units, and even given some unflattering nicknames. During this defensive battle, many assumed that this company hadn't performed well. However, when the regimental commander personally inspected the front line, they discovered 51 American corpses in front of one of the platoon's positions. Although this platoon was reduced to only six men, two of whom were injured, these six soldiers managed to capture 16 American soldiers who had charged at them. During those days on the south bank of the Han River, our heroic troops didn't just defend strongly, leaving piles of enemy corpses and rivers of blood in front of our positions. The key was that they constantly launched fierce counterattacks, retaking lost ground and inflicting even heavier casualties on the enemy. I frequently heard commanders tell their troops, don't just sit there and take it from the enemy. You shouldn't let yourselves get hit. You should strike back, resolutely counterattack. On one occasion, an enemy battalion had advanced to within less than a thousand meters of one of our divisional command posts. That very night, one of our units launched a powerful counterattack. They cut off the retreat of the American battalion, nearly wiping it out, and captured more than 80 prisoners. Only a few enemy soldiers managed to escape. According to one of the officers in that unit, when our troops heard they were going to counterattack, you wouldn't believe the energy they suddenly had, like horses released to graze in springtime, impossible to rein in. That night, from a long distance, I could hear the artillery platoon leader shouting, Ready, fire. Ready, fire. The battalion commander scolded them. Why are you shouting so loudly? What good does that do? But they were so excited they didn't even hear him and just kept yelling, Ready, fire. Ready, fire. They were so fired up they couldn't even listen to anyone else. 
There was one squad that had lost contact with the rest of the unit, no one knew where they had gone. It turned out they had moved too quickly and charged straight into the heart of the enemy, wiping out an enemy squad and bringing back five prisoners. Only then did we find them. Reckless, don't you think? The most amusing story is about our platoon leader, Comrade Zhang Lichen. He's a battle hero who's already earned five major commendations. This time, when he charged the enemy's position, he saw four American soldiers with the lower halves of their bodies still tucked in their sleeping bags. In his fury, he couldn't wait for the other soldiers, so he immediately shot one of them, then pounced on the others. He stomped on one, grabbed the other two by the hair with both hands, and shoved their faces into the dirt, shouting, Chinese people used to be beneath your feet, but today, it's your turn to bow low. The two didn't understand his words, only rolling their eyes in fear. Just look at our comrades, aren't they like little tigers? In the fierce and grueling defensive battle, both commanders and soldiers eagerly anticipated the arrival of one specific day, much like the excitement of meeting their dearest loved ones. This day was February 12th, the day our forces on the eastern front of the Han River would launch their counteroffensive. As expected, that day approached, second by second, and finally arrived. Not three days later, news came that we had annihilated two enemy divisions in the area of Hongxiong. These victories, combined, represented what our people back home would later see, over 23,000 enemy soldiers destroyed on the Han River front, a number that held within it countless heroic stories. At this moment, the soldiers at the front, after brushing off the dust accumulated over the relentless days and nights, orderly crossed back over the soon to thaw, Silver Han River to the northern bank to rest. Yet the cowardly enemy didn't dare set foot on those silver hills, still shining with the light of heroic deeds, even two days after our forces had withdrawn. March 16, 1951 Asterisk. New Year's Eve on the front line. During the defensive battle on the south bank of the Han River, who would have thought that today was the Lunar New Year? On the battlefield, the patches of scorched grass were still black, and broken branches of pine trees lay scattered everywhere. What could possibly remind anyone that today was the New Year? At dusk, the fighting ceased. In the small patch of pine forest on this part of the battlefield, only three trees remained standing. One was half burned yellow, another bent over, its trunk snapped and drooping towards the ground, but the third tree still stood tall and dark, its black silhouette looming. After a day of intense fighting, the morning's rations sat heavy in the stomach, and people began to engage in idle chatter. One soldier asked, What do you think is worse, being thirsty or being hungry? Thirst is worse. I agree, thirst is worse. Hunger, I can handle. But whenever one opinion is voiced, there's always another to oppose it. Someone immediately counted, You say thirst is worse, but remember when we were on Feihu Mountain for five days and nights, and we only ate two meals. You all picked up every single kernel of raw corn from the ground and ate it. Why else would you keep tightening your belt, drilling extra holes when you ran out of notches? Someone quickly shot back, you say hunger isn't as bad, but when the enemy shells blacken the snow, why did you grab a handful and stuff it in your mouth, eating it so happily? As they debated, a loud, hearty, and joyful voice suddenly called out from the hillside, comrades. Today is the first day of the Lunar New Year, and I've brought you some meat. Everyone looked over and saw that it was old Zhang, the cook, hauling a large sack up the hill from the rear. He was panting heavily, like a bellows, barely able to catch his breath as he called out. Comrades, on behalf of the kitchen, and the quartermaster, I wish you all a happy new year. Old Zhang, the cook, shouted as he struggled to catch his breath. Everyone, upon hearing this, looked at him with a mix of surprise and sudden realization. Oh, today really is the first day of the Lunar New Year. Some, still unsure, began counting on their fingers, finally confirming, no mistake, today is the New Year's Day. Old Zhang, with a big smile across his face, walked up and dropped the bag to the ground. He pulled out several brightly colored square packages, some wrapped with meat, others containing rice cakes that he had made using a Korean recipe. He carefully handed out two packages to each person. As he handed out the meat, he added with particular emphasis. Comrade, don't underestimate this, it's from the motherland. Really, from the motherland, absolutely from the motherland. Old Zhang proudly puffed out his chest and said. Some soldiers immediately raised the meat high and shouted, Comrades, look, this came from the motherland. Others, with their weary eyes now gleaming, smiled as they stared at the meat in their hands. Some took a bite right away, 
while others carefully placed it in their bunkers, as if afraid someone might bump into it. It was New Year's Day, and the motherland had sent supplies to them, how could they not be happy? The atmosphere on the front line instantly became lively. The squad leader quickly assigned tasks. Some went to gather small pine branches for a fire, others used bayonets to scrape away the snow blackened by artillery blasts, uncovering clean white snow. Others went down to the riverbed to fetch ice blocks. One soldier, his hands wrapped in bandages, pulled out a tarp to cover the entrance to the dugout, making sure no light escaped. Before long, pots filled with white snow and little metal pans full of ice were boiling away on the fire. The soldiers crowded around, taking turns slicing the meat into thin pieces with small knives. The flickering flames lit up each young face, painting him a warm red. One soldier, pointing to his pot of snow, a few pieces of meat, a rice cake, and the leftover rice from the morning, said with satisfaction, look at this. Isn't this a proper New Year's feast? Not a bad way to celebrate. From another dugout, someone quietly called out, come over here, I've got a little fish. One more dish than you guys. As if on cue, the enemy planes returned for their nightly patrol, dropping a string of flares along the front lines. They hovered at regular intervals, drifting lazily in the sky like floating lanterns. The enemy's artillery fired sporadically, one round close, the next far away. But except for the soldiers on guard, the others continued celebrating their New Year's night. One of the pots of snow had melted down, and the soldiers passed it around as if it were fine wine, each taking only a small sip before passing it to the next person. When they ate the meat, they would carefully pick up a piece, gaze at it for a moment, and then slowly place it in their mouths, taking small bites as if afraid that by eating it too quickly, they would lose the precious taste of their homeland forever. One soldier, as if suddenly reminded of something, pulled the tea mug away from his mouth and said, I bet it's so lively back in our homeland today. Yeah, I bet they're dancing the Yanga with such joy right now. Someone chimed in, are you guys missing the peaceful life back in the rear? This comment really displeased the soldier who had just spoken. He immediately set his tea mug down by the fire pit and said, if I missed the peaceful life back home, I wouldn't have come out here. If I wanted to see our homeland turn into something like Korea, villages in flames, empty roads you can't walk on, people pressing their faces to the ground to dig holes, eating snow, then what am I doing out here? I came because I want our homeland to stay lively every day, like a market day, with Yanga dancing, drums beating, farmers working the fields, singing, learning culture, and walking freely on the roads. The squad leader interjected, all right, all right, it's New Year's, not a debate session. A rough, boisterous voice then chimed in, as if trying to lighten the mood, liveliness or not, I reckon no firecrackers can beat the noise we've got here, and it doesn't even cost any money. In this squad, however, there was one person who wasn't saying anything, resting his chin in his hand. The squad leader noticed and asked, why aren't you saying anything? What should I say? He lifted his head and lowered his hand. You all keep talking about the motherland. You've all earned the right to return home proudly. Some of you have earned commendations, some have joined the party, only I'm still left behind. Everyone rushed to reassure him. You're not lagging behind at all. Exactly. You did well today too. You were the one who held onto the machine gun, and when it broke, you picked up the carbine and kept shooting. Didn't you kill seven or eight enemies today? The squad leader also added, your achievements have already been reported to the company commander. Plus, the party branch is currently discussing your situation. One soldier leaned in close, trying to cheer him up, and recited a rhythmic verse. Young man, don't be so grim. A frowning face doesn't suit you, with strong resolve and spirit high, it's not hard to join the party or gain renown. Everyone burst into laughter, it's not that I'm pessimistic, nor is it just about gaining merit or joining the party, the soldier explained, a faint smile crossing his face, I'm just disappointed in myself, my contribution to the motherland and to the Korean people feels so small. Compared to everyone else, I've fallen behind. Since coming abroad, I've seen how much suffering the Korean people have endured at the hands of the American devils. Even if Korea is liberated, and you all return home with medals, I'll still be here, helping the Korean people rebuild their homes, trying to contribute as much as I can. Suddenly, the tarp covering the dugout entrance moved, and a head poked in. The person's face was covered in grey soot, only half of their cap remaining, the other half burned away. Everyone immediately recognised him, hey, it was the platoon leader. Everyone warmly greeted him.
Platoon leader, how's your new year going? How's your squad doing, comrades? Some soldiers offered water to the platoon leader, while others handed him pieces of meat. They all squeezed together to make space for him, but the platoon leader could only manage to get half of his body into the dugout. The platoon leader said, Comrades, listen up. I'm passing along a message from the company headquarters. Everyone quieted down, and the platoon leader continued, Just now, the political instructor announced that the battalion has commended our company for fighting well today. Many comrades have earned commendations. Your squad leader, though wounded, stayed on the front lines and led the entire squad to repel 12 enemy assaults, earning a small merit. Everyone looked at the squad leader. He lowered his head slightly and, with a faint smile, glanced at his bandaged hand. Meanwhile, the soldier who wasn't yet a party member stared wide-eyed at the platoon leader. The platoon leader went on, additionally, the party branch has announced that comrade Wang Ying has been confirmed as a full party member. The eyes of the soldier who hadn't joined the party grew even wider. The platoon leader finally turned to him and said, the party branch has also approved comrade Wang Shujin as a probationary member of the Communist Party of China. Wow, everyone's eyes immediately focused on Wang Shujin. If only Wang Shujin were alone in the dugout, it would be much easier to express himself. But with so many people around, how should he react? What should he say? Where should he put his hands? He decided not to smile but his face was already grinning. He tried to remain calm, but his face felt hot and was probably already turning red. What should he do? Wang Shujin, why aren't you saying anything? Wang Shujin, say something. I, I, Wang Shujin, his face flushed, stammered, comrades, I. I will live up to the honor of being called a communist party member. Comrades, to celebrate your commendations and party membership, the platoon leader said, Pulling out a half-smoked cigarette from his pocket, our battalion commander got two cigarettes from the regimental commander. The battalion command shared one, and the other was given to our company commander. The company commander and political instructor smoked half, and they gave the rest to me. When the soldiers saw the half-cigarette, their eyes nearly popped out, but they still politely said, you should smoke it, platoon leader. The platoon leader carefully lit it in the fire, took a puff, then handed it to Wang Shujin, giving him a pat on the shoulder before laughing and walking off. Wang Shujin didn't take a puff, he passed it to the squad leader instead. The squad leader forced him to take a small drag, and then each soldier took a tiny puff, passing the cigarette around. The thin rings of smoke carried with them the weight of countless days and nights of toil, pride, and joy, swirling and dancing in the small dugout. Everyone gazed at the smoke, as if they could hear the faint ringing of silver bells as it drifted through the air. Just then, everyone heard a strange wailing sound coming from outside. The squad leader crawled out of the dugout, and the others followed, listening intently. After the strange sound subsided, they heard someone shouting from the hillside below, soldiers of the communist army. Today, I want to say a few words to you. Everyone knew, it was the enemy's frontline broadcast again. The loudspeaker continued its propaganda. Today is the new year, and look how much you're suffering on the mountain, no food, no water, your feet are swollen from the cold. Immediately, someone cursed, screw you. But the broadcast went on as if undeterred. We, the United Nations forces, are here to save Korea. The UN has declared you invaders. Bang, someone, unable to bear it any longer, fired a shot and cursed, we don't even take off our shoes when we enter a house, but now we have to self-criticize. Us. Invaders, the squad leader jumped up and shouted, Shoot that Chiang Kai shek dog. Bang, 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 bang. The sound of carbines and automatic weapons, captured from the Americans, echoed across the line. Still, the broadcast continued, We have planes and artillery. What do you have? Surrender now. You can come down the side paths. Several voices from the soldiers shouted curses at once, some pointing angrily at the enemy positions. If you have planes and artillery, why can't you break through our defenses? Even without planes, we chased you all the way here. If we had planes, we'd have driven your sorry behinds into the South China Sea to feed the turtles by now. Surrender, here, have some bullets first. Another round of automatic gunfire rang out, but the loudspeaker kept droning on. At that moment, Wang Shujin approached the squad leader and said, Squad leader, let me take care of that cursed broadcast. I'll go too, said Wang Ying. I'm coming, me too, follow orders, the squad leader said firmly, Wang Shujin and Wang Ying will go.
The two of them bit off the caps of their grenades, checked their bullets, and started down the slope. Thirty minutes later, there was a series of loud explosions. Just as the broadcast was saying, if you don't surrender, we will surely wipe you out, it abruptly fell silent. But one hour passed, then two, and there was still no sign of the two returning. The squad leader grew increasingly anxious. He told the others to rest in the dugout while he stayed by the sentry's side, waiting. In the middle of the night, they heard the rustling of pine branches below. Squinting, they could make out five or six shadowy figures climbing up the mountain. Listening carefully, they could even hear the muttering of foreign voices. The squad leader quietly alerted the sentry, get ready. He slipped the pin of his grenade onto his finger. Who's there? It's me, came Wang Shujin's voice from the darkness. The squad leader, though puzzled, remained alert and shouted, why so many people? We captured some prisoners, Wang Ying answered. Overjoyed, the squad leader couldn't help but shout, comrades, they've brought live captives. As he quickened his pace to meet them, the rest of the squad rushed out of the dugout to join him. Wang Shujin and Wang Ying were standing there, each carrying seven or eight carbines on their backs, while in front of them stood four prisoners. There was also another man, dressed in civilian clothes, holding a rifle and standing off to the side. The prisoners looked like bare tree stumps, standing there frozen and expressionless. Excited, the squad leader asked, how did you pull this off? The man in civilian clothes quickly interjected, are you the squad leader? I owe you an apology. I'm a scout from divisional headquarters. The higher-ups sent me to catch a tongue. I found these four guys, he gestured toward the prisoners, hiding in a small hut, snoring away in their sleeping bags. But it wasn't easy for me to handle them alone, and just then, I ran into your two fine warriors. I asked for their help, and we managed to capture these guys. I didn't get your approval beforehand, so I'm sorry about that. The squad leader, already beaming with joy, quickly replied, Oh, don't worry about it, don't worry. At that moment, the four prisoners, seeing everyone talking to the squad leader, suddenly dropped to their knees, banging their heads on the ground and mimicking a slicing gesture across their necks with their hands. They mumbled something incomprehensible, causing the soldiers to burst into laughter. Some of the soldiers jokingly mimicked the gesture, slicing their hands across their necks and shaking their heads, which prompted the prisoners to nervously stand back up, still looking like stiff tree stumps. Wang Shujin and Wang Ying approached the squad leader, dropped the rifles from their shoulders onto the ground, and Wang Shujin reported, Squad leader, we blew up the loudspeaker, and after that, we helped capture the prisoners. On our way back, we saw over 20 corpses at the bottom of the hill, all American soldiers killed by us during the day. We managed to collect 13 carbines. Before we came back, we made sure to flip each one of those dead bodies face up. Why would you do that? The squad leader asked. Why? Wang Shujin proudly replied, so that tomorrow, if those dogs dare to attack again, they'll see the faces of their fallen comrades when they charge. He then pointed to the rifles on the ground, squad leader, want to see how well these rifles work. The soldiers scrambled to pick up the guns, and the squad leader grabbed one too. The rifle was covered in frost. He wiped it clean with his sleeve and fired a few shots toward the enemy's position. The other soldiers, eager to join in, fired their rifles too, shouting. Boys, just wait for tomorrow. Boys, just wait for tomorrow. The crisp sound of gunfire echoed through the valley. The night wind howled, and the morning star had already risen. During the endless days and nights on the southern bank of the Han River, who would have thought that today was the Lunar New Year? But the New Year doesn't shy away from even the harshest of places. It passed through the soldiers' positions, just as it did in the homeland, with its joyful steps. March 25, 1951 Asterisk. Who are the most lovable people? Every day in Korea, I have been moved by various things. My emotions have been flowing uncontrollably, like a river in full surge. It makes me want to tell my friends back in our homeland everything. But what I most urgently want to share with you is an important experience of mine, a deepening realization of who our most lovable people are. Who are the most lovable people? Of course, our workers and peasants are incredibly lovable. But what I want to talk about here are their children, those who have taken up arms to dedicate themselves to the revolutionary struggle, the children of the workers and peasants who have been armed with Marxism-Leninism and Mao Zedong thought. I feel that these soldiers are the most lovable people. Some people may vaguely wonder, are you talking about those, soldiers? They seem so ordinary and simple, 
they don't appear to have any great knowledge or refined emotions. But I must say, this is because such people haven't had enough contact with our soldiers, they haven't truly gotten to know them. Our soldiers possess qualities that are so pure and noble, wills that are so tenacious and strong, temperaments that are so humble and unpretentious, and hearts that are so beautiful and generous. Let me tell you a story to explain this. It was during the second campaign when a volunteer army unit made a fierce push into enemy territory to cut off the enemy's escape route at Junyu Ri. As they reached Shutang Station, they encountered the retreating enemy who was also attempting to flee via the highway. The leading company of the unit quickly seized a small, barren hill by the roadside, blocking the enemy's path. A brutal battle ensued. Desperate to escape, the enemy deployed 32 planes, more than 10 tanks, and launched wave after wave of attacks on the company's position. The entire hilltop was churned up by artillery fire, and the flames from gasoline bombs scorched the land. Yet, amid the smoke and fire, the brave soldiers, shouting slogans, repeatedly killed the enemy as they approached. The bodies of enemy soldiers piled up like grain before the hill, and blood flowed, staining the earth. Despite the heavy losses, the enemy continued their desperate attempts to capture the position, hoping to avoid the complete annihilation of their main force. The battle raged for eight hours. Eventually, the warriors ran out of ammunition. The enemy, swarming over the hill, pushed them down to the base. Even as gasoline bombs set their bodies ablaze, the warriors did not retreat. They threw down their rifles and, with flames blazing from their hats and bodies, rushed at the enemy, grabbing hold of them so that the fire burning on their own bodies would also consume the enemy who had taken the position. According to the battalion commander, after the battle, the entire company's weapons were shattered, with machine gun parts scattered across the hillside. The fallen heroes lay in various postures, some clutching the enemy's waist, others holding the enemy's head, and still others gripping the enemy's neck, pressing them to the ground, burned and intertwined with the enemy in death. One soldier, even in death, tightly gripped a grenade, its body smeared with brain matter, and beside him lay a dead American soldier, his skull shattered, brain matter splattered across the ground. Another soldier had the enemy's half-bitten ear clenched between his teeth. When burying the martyrs, their hands were clasped so tightly around the enemy that their fingers had to be broken to separate them. Despite the heavy casualties, this company killed over 300 enemy soldiers. Most importantly, they bought enough time for our main force to catch up and encircle the enemy, leading to their ultimate destruction. This was one of the most heroic battles on the Korean battlefield, the Battle of Songgafeng or the Battle of Shutang Station. If a monument were to be erected to commemorate this battle, let me inscribe the names of the martyrs who rushed at the enemy engulfed in flames and fought to the death with bayonets. Their names are Wang Jinchuan, Xing Yutung, Wang Wenying, Shung Guangken, Wang Jinho, Zhao Shiji, Sui Jinshan, Li Yuanan, Ding Zhendai, Zhang Gisheng, Kui Yuliang, and Li Shuguo. There is also one soldier whose name can never be known. May these martyrs live on for eternity. The battalion commander who recounted the above events spoke with a slow, heavy tone. His emotions weighed on him deeply. He said that when he was burying the martyrs on the battlefield, he shed tears. But he quickly added, Don't think I cried out of sorrow for them. I cried out of pride. I feel that our soldiers are too great, too lovable. I couldn't help but be moved to tears by their heroism. Friends, how do you feel when you hear such stories of bravery? Don't you find our soldiers to be lovable? Don't you feel proud of our homeland for having such heroes? Our soldiers are merciless to the enemy, but they show immense love for the Korean people, filled with profound internationalist passion. On the northern bank of the Han River, I met a young soldier named Ma Yuxiang, only 21 years old, from Qingdang County, Heilongjiang Province. He had a slightly dark but healthy reddish complexion, stood tall, and was as simple and endearing as a stalk of red sorghum in the autumn fields. However, having just returned from the front lines, he appeared a bit tired, and his eyes were still bloodshot. He had originally been with the artillery unit. One night, he was awakened by the sound of crying and went out to investigate. He found an elderly Korean woman sitting on a hill, weeping. Her house had been bombed, and she had built a makeshift shelter in the mountains, only for it to be destroyed by another bombing. Ma Yuxiang immediately requested a transfer to the infantry, as the infantry unit happened to need more men, and his request was granted. I asked him, isn't fighting the enemy in the artillery unit just as effective? It's different, he replied. The closer I am to the enemy, the more satisfying it feels, and the more it helps vent my anger. 
During those days on the southern bank of the Han River, one day, after coming down from the front line to cook, he had just entered a village when several enemy planes swooped in, firing machine guns and dropping two large incendiary bombs. Several houses caught fire, and the blaze was intense, with thick smoke making it dangerous to approach. At that moment, he heard the wailing cry of a child through the smoke and flames. He immediately rushed through the smoke to investigate and saw a middle-aged Korean man lying in the yard, dead, while the child's cries came from inside the house. As Ma Yuxiang approached the door, flames were already roaring, making it impossible to enter. The paper on the doors and windows had caught fire. The child's cries, carried through the billowing smoke, were clear and heart-wrenching. As he recounted this moment, he said, could I not go inside? I couldn't, I thought, if this were happening in my homeland, I would go in without hesitation. So, how could I not do the same in Korea? Aren't the Korean people just like our people back home? He kicked open the door and charged inside. The room was filled with thick, grey smoke, and though he could hear the child crying, he couldn't see anything. His eyes burned from the heat, and his face felt as if it were being slashed by knives. He had no idea if he was on fire himself, but he didn't care, he just felt around the floor. First, he grabbed onto an adult's body, but couldn't move them. Then, he groped behind the adult and finally found the child's legs. He grabbed the child, scooped him up, and jumped out of the house. When he looked at the child, he saw that it was a beautiful little one, dressed in a small jacket, with bare legs kicking frantically as they wailed. Ma Yuxiang thought to himself, asterisk, whether you cry or not, if I don't save your family, who will take care of you? Asterisk. The fire had grown even more intense, and the furniture and belongings inside the house were now ablaze. He put the child down on the ground and rushed back into the burning house. I pulled the adult, and she groaned once, so I pulled harder to drag her out, but then she stopped moving. I leaned closer and saw that the blood flowing from her face had already stained her white clothes red, and her eyes were closed. I knew she was gone, so I hurried out of the house, extinguished the flames on my clothes, and picked up the now orphaned child. Friends, how do you feel when you hear such a story? Don't you think our soldiers are the most lovable people? Everyone knows that the Korean battlefield is difficult. But how do the soldiers themselves feel about it? Once, I saw a soldier sitting in an air raid shelter, eating roasted flour, followed by a spoonful of snow. I asked him, don't you find this hard? He paused, pulling back the spoonful of snow from his mouth, smiled, and said, how could I not? We revolutionaries aren't made of stone, but it's precisely in this hardship that we find our glory. He then put the spoon down altogether, clearly energized, and continued, take eating snow, for example. I'm eating snow here so that the people in our homeland don't have to. They can sit in bright houses, brew a pot of tea, and sit by the fire, making whatever food they like. He pointed to the cramped, damp air raid shelter and said, and take sitting in these dugouts, sure, it's suffocating. Outside, there's a beautiful sun we can't enjoy, and roads we can't walk on. But because I'm here sitting in this air raid shelter, the people back home don't have to sit in one. They can stroll down the roads freely, take a bike ride if they want, walk if they like, chatting along the way without a care. If my suffering here can bring happiness to our people, then that is our greatest happiness. He popped the snow back into his mouth and, as if summarizing, said, shedding a little blood here is nothing. What's this bit of suffering compared to that? I asked him, do you miss home? He laughed, who wouldn't miss home? Saying you don't would be a lie. But I don't want to go back just yet. If I return, and the people back home ask, how did you complete the task we entrusted you with? What would I say? Korea is half liberated, half still under enemy control. What kind of answer would that be? I then asked, after all the dangers you've faced and hardships you've endured, is there anything you want from your homeland or from Korea? He thought for a moment before answering, we don't want anything. But, to be honest, this might not be appropriate, I think we'd like something this small. He smiled, using his fingers to gesture something the size of a coin, and, worried I wouldn't understand, added, a Korean Liberation Medal. We'd love to pin it on our chests when we return to our homeland. Friends, there's no need for more examples. You already understand the kind of people our soldiers are, what qualities they embody, and how beautiful and expansive their souls are. They are the finest soldiers in history, in the world. They are the finest flowers of all great peoples in the world, the flowers of our proud homeland. We take pride in our heroes and are proud to live in this land of heroes. D. 
Dear friends, as you ride the first streetcar in the morning to work, as you carry your plow to the fields, as you finish your cup of soy milk and head to school with your book bag, as you sit down at your desk to start your day's work, as you hand an apple to your child, or take a leisurely walk with your loved one. Friend, do you realize that you are living in happiness? You might be surprised and say, but this is just ordinary life. However, those who return from Korea will know that you are indeed living in happiness. Please recognize this happiness, because only when you do will you better understand why our soldiers in Korea risk their lives without hesitation. Friend, you love our motherland, our great leader Chairman Mao, and you will surely come to love our soldiers deeply, because they are truly the most lovable people. April 1, 1951 Asterisk. The Soldier and the Homeland. I won't tell more heroic stories here, friends, you've heard enough already, though what you know is but a drop in the ocean compared to the countless acts of heroism. What I want to discuss is this. Why, when the volunteer army was still armed with inferior weapons, were they not frightened by the enemy's brutal artillery and aircraft? How did they display such unparalleled courage and strength, overwhelming the most powerful imperialist army, the American invaders, time and time again? In other words, what great force supported every member of this unit? What extraordinary force was hidden deep in the hearts of these heroes? I slowly began to understand the answer to this question. One time, while our troops were resting on the northern bank of the Han River, I attended a discussion in a platoon. The soldiers sitting beside me were covered in the dust of countless days and nights, with some still bearing the burn marks from incendiary bombs on their uniforms. They did not look prideful, but humble as they listened. As I looked at their simple, endearing faces, I thought to myself, these are the victors who fought against the world's most brutal imperialist force. These are the ones who, even if only one man remained, would hold their position to the end. I couldn't help but speak with deep respect. Comrades, you have worked so hard. Before my words had even landed, they immediately responded, almost in unison. For the homeland, this is nothing. For the homeland, of course. We're doing this for the homeland. A tall, strong soldier, with hands calloused and bleeding, extended his hands toward me and, with a cheerful smile, said. These hands are working for our homeland. After that, they all turned their eyes on me. I, how could I possibly describe the feeling carried in their voices at that moment? I could only feel the immense weight and power of their words shaking me to my core. The meeting came to an end, but the soldiers weren't ready to disperse. One of them looked me over again and asked, Comrade, did you come from Beijing? Yes, I replied. Then, he said, gazing at me, do you know how our chairman Mao is doing? Is his health good? Before I could answer, someone interjected, I bet with how busy he is, he must have lost some weight. Yeah, he's probably thinner, several soldiers nodded in agreement. I answered, Chairman Mao is indeed very busy, but his health is good. At that moment, the young soldiers became even more lively and excited, bombarding me with questions. Some asked about Tiananmen, some about factories in the northeast, others about land reform back home, student enlistment, last year's crop yields, or where the new railway lines had been extended. They even asked about things I normally wouldn't notice. In short, they were deeply concerned with every aspect of our homeland. They spoke passionately, as if discussing the most beloved and intimate person in their lives, down to the smallest details. I smiled and said, wow, you all really love talking about the homeland, huh? Not just us, one soldier said, our political instructor even wrote a poem. A poem, what's it about? I quickly asked. One of the soldiers recited, Sons and daughters of China, take up arms, to aid Korea and defend our lands, blood and sacrifice we fear not. We shine bright for our homeland, asterisk. Later, I shared the soldier's deep love for the homeland with the regiment's political commissar. He nodded, confirming that nearly the entire unit felt the same way, and then he told me this story. There was a squad leader in the regiment named Jiang Shifu, who was also a member of the party's committee. He was known for being unwavering in his adherence to principles and incredibly strong-willed. No matter who it was, if he saw even the slightest breach of discipline, it was unacceptable to him. During the battle at Jingan Li on the southern bank of the Han River, he killed many enemies but was severely wounded himself. It was clear that this brave and admirable soldier was nearing the end of his life. His face remained as calm as ever, but when he looked at his comrades, his eyes were filled with even deeper emotion. When the medic rushed over to bandage his wounds, he shook his head and, in a very soft voice, said, Comrades, I can no longer stay with you, 
said Jiang Shifu, as he neared the end. His comrades moved closer to his face, asking, Old Jiang, do you have any last words for us? He shook his head and grasped the hand closest to him, saying, As long as the people of our homeland and the people of Korea find happiness, I will. With those words, a peaceful smile spread across his face, and his eyes slowly, gently closed. After the political commissar finished recounting this story, he reflected with a solemn expression, saying, Of course, before we left our homeland, we all knew we were fighting for our country. But after going abroad and seeing everything with our own eyes, it feels like we truly understood what the homeland means and how precious it really is. He added, take our regiment commander as an example. He felt the same way. During the second campaign, after days and nights of continuous fighting, our regiment was ordered to flank the enemy and march 140 li, around 70 kilometers, without rest. The troops didn't have time to eat and marched day and night. After covering 90 li, they were utterly exhausted, some soldiers stumbled forward, half asleep, others had blisters all over their feet and were barely able to walk, one battalion even sat down to rest. But what about our regiment commander? Despite his age and frailty, when he saw that the battalion had stopped, he gasped for breath, struggling as he approached the battalion commander to reprimand him. Then, standing there, he raised his voice and said to everyone, Don't forget where we come from. We come from the northern side of the Yalu River. The troops looked at him, speechless. Then, pointing north with a firm hand, he asked sharply, Comrades, what lies north of the Yalu River? The homeland. The soldiers replied, Yes, the homeland, the commander repeated in a deep tone, So, we've marched 90 li out of 140, and we're stopping now, letting the enemy escape. Can we face our homeland if we fail? The political commissar smiled as he told the story and continued, Strangely enough, just the mention of homeland gives us incredible strength. Without resting, the troops pressed on and reached their destination. The homeland, oh, what tremendous power you hold over the hearts of these soldiers. You are not just a word on their lips, you are rooted deep in their souls, growing and blooming within them. In my quest to better understand the minds of these heroes, I kept observing. One evening, as I was preparing to head to the front lines, I noticed a group of people gathered at the edge of a village. From the group, I heard a loud voice say, Fellow villagers, I didn't want to come down, but they forced me to. I walked up to take a closer look and saw a few villagers from the northeast stretcher team gathered around a wounded soldier lying on the stretcher, talking. The soldier, about 21 or 22 years old, seemed like an ordinary member of our ranks, with nothing particularly remarkable about him. His head was wrapped in thick bandages, and both of his hands were bandaged, exposed outside the blanket. The villagers noticed me standing there, and one of them exclaimed, This young man is truly something. His backbone is strong, a true volunteer soldier. Another added, He single-handedly killed several American soldiers. A large shell exploded right next to him, and his head was wounded, he was knocked out cold. When the medic bandaged him up and was about to carry him down the hill, he woke up and said, what are you taking me down for? I'm not leaving. Then he grabbed a machine gun and kept fighting. The second time, a bullet hit him, taking off part of a finger. The political instructor told him to retreat, but he replied, I'm tall and big, losing a bit of flesh is nothing. If I can't shoot, I can still load bullets. The fighting was intense, so they allowed him to stay. But the third time, while throwing a grenade, his other hand was wounded. Afraid the political instructor would force him to leave, he went up to the instructor himself and said, Comrade instructor, please let me stay. Our squad leader has already sacrificed himself. No matter what, I can't retreat. My hands are useless, but I can still speak. I'll be a messenger. People say that as he was speaking, blood dripped from his fingers, but his expression didn't change. The instructor tried to comfort him and persuade him to go down, but he refused. Finally, the instructor gave him a direct order, go down. This is the party's decision. Ha! Only then did this young man reluctantly obey, pinching his nose and descending. And even now, he keeps talking about it. Yes, the wounded soldier lying on the stretcher chimed in, perhaps too excited, as he tried to gesture but couldn't move his hands. Only his elbows shifted slightly as he said, I didn't want to come down, I could have completed the communications task. His eyes gleamed with the bright light of youth as he looked at me, as if asking, Comrade, don't you think I did the right thing? I crouched down beside him and reassured him, Comrade, you're truly incredible, and you fought so bravely. 
To my surprise, this seemed to embarrass him. His bright eyes showed a hint of youthful shyness, and he smiled slightly. I pulled the blanket back up to cover his exposed hands, then looked at him and asked why he had been so courageous. He smiled again, then replied with a serious tone. Comrade, how could I be unclear about this? Just think about what we've seen since the day we crossed the Yalu River. He then began to recount their journey from the Yalu River to the Han River. What they walked through wasn't lush land but scorched earth, one burning village after another. Sometimes they passed through streets engulfed in flames on both sides, or they camped beside the bodies of murdered Koreans. His tone became particularly heavy when he said, one time, we stayed in a village. When we arrived at night, everything was still intact, and the local people warmly cared for us. And by coincidence, the family I stayed with had an old Korean mother who looked just like my own. She was also in her forties, only dressed in white clothes and a white skirt. I was exhausted that night and had a good sleep. When I woke up, I noticed that the tear in my pants had been mended. I asked my comrades, and they told me it was the old mother who had sewn it for me, with her daughter-in-law holding the lamp while she leaned over the kang bed. I truly felt like she was my own mother, but his tone grew more sorrowful as he continued, the next day, after completing my task, I returned to find the village engulfed in flames, with all the houses bombed to rubble. I rushed to the house where I had stayed and found the daughter-in-law dead from the blast, and the old mother's legs had been blown off. She was still clutching her grandson, crawling on her knees. When she saw me, she started crying, and my tears began to fall too. I quickly took the child and carried the old mother to the medical station. My squad was filled with anger, some stomped their feet, others cursed, and many shed tears. I couldn't sleep that whole night tossing and turning as I thought about the cruelty of imperialism. They would rather wipe out the entire Korean population just to occupy the country. Then, I thought about my own life. The Japanese killed my father, and Chiang Kai-shek took my brother away. I was left with only my mother. Thanks to Chairman Mao's leadership, we won, and the Chinese people stood up. The new China was established. I received a few acres of land, got married, and had children. I no longer had to herd pigs or cows for others, no longer suffered from cold and hunger. I had a home and a country. But if we let the American devils reach our China, would my mother still be alive? Would my wife and children still be alive? They wouldn't just kill or burn him, they'd tear my home up from its roots. He paused for a moment, his young eyes filled with pain, as if he were reliving those terrible scenes. Then he continued, that night, every time I closed my eyes, I saw how great our country is, how vast, how populous. And if the Americans were to bomb, burn, and bring what they did to Korea to our land, what would our homeland become? His voice then grew passionate as he called out to me, Comrade. What would happen if we let that happen? And can we say that the establishment of our new China came easily? For it, countless comrades shed their blood, fighting from the south to the north and then from the north back to the south. Who can count how many roads they marched, how many battles they fought, or how many foxholes they dug in all kinds of terrain? Sometimes they fought to the death for a tiny house, spilled blood over a few meters of land, and to this day, there are still those who carry American bullets in their flesh and bones. New China, this was won by trading our flesh and blood. On this journey abroad, when we passed through the Northeast, I saw the factory chimneys, big ones and small ones, standing like a forest, puffing out smoke. Oh, how my heart bloomed with joy. You can't imagine how happy I was, or how far my thoughts went. Is it possible that we would ever let this people's world, our world, be taken from us again? Would we ever let our hard-earned construction turn to ash? No, if those dogs try to so much as touch a hair of our homeland, I'll make sure they bleed for it. I want him to know whether their heads are made of flesh or not. He grew so excited that he exposed his bandaged hands again. I just think, as long as we can protect our new China, as long as our people are safe, what does it matter if I die in a foreign land? I've been wounded multiple times in this war, and they wanted to pull me off the front lines. But what does it matter if I die, bleeding a little for the homeland and for the suffering people of Korea, what is that compared to the cause? Friends, this is what I wanted to tell you, this precious journey of thought that our soldiers undergo on the Korean front, the invincible greatness of these heroes' hearts. This is the very thing that ignites the spark of victory, even in the most brutal and difficult battles. Let us love our great homeland even more.
For the people of China, who have achieved revolutionary victory, homeland is no ordinary word. It is a name dear to our hearts, a noble name. What is the homeland? In the past, there has never been a single sentence or a few words that could perfectly capture its meaning, and perhaps that is impossible. When people speak of the homeland, some may think of its hard-working, simple people, others may think of its majestic landscapes and brilliant culture, some may think of the red flag on Tiananmen Square, stained with the blood of countless martyrs, fluttering in the wind, still others may think of the factories joyfully belching fireworks of progress, some may picture the beautiful gardens filled with song. Of course, in all these thoughts, there is also a person, a figure who is like both a father and a friend, tirelessly thinking day and night about how to push the revolution forward, how to shield them from disaster, and how to bring them the happiness they so deserve. This is their proud and wise leader, but no matter what someone imagines when they think of the homeland, they likely envision all of this. And can we say that the establishment of our new China came easily? For it, countless comrades shed their blood, fighting from the south to the north, and then from the north back to the south. Who can count how many roads they marched, how many battles they fought, or how many foxholes they dug in every imaginable type of terrain? Sometimes, they risked their lives for a tiny house, or spilled blood over just a few meters of land. To this day, many carry American bullets embedded in their flesh and bones. Our new China was one with our blood and flesh. On this trip abroad, when I passed through the northeast, I saw the factory chimneys, big ones and small ones rising like a forest, puffing smoke into the air. My heart felt like it was blooming. You have no idea how happy I was or how far my thoughts wandered. Could we ever let this people's world, our hard-won world, be taken from us again? Could we let our progress turn to ashes? No, if any of those bastards so much as touch a single hair of our homeland, I'll make them bleed. I'll make them know whether their heads are made of flesh or not. He grew so excited that he exposed his bandaged hands again. I think, as long as we can protect our new China and keep our people safe, what does it matter if I die in a foreign land? I've been wounded multiple times in this war, and they want to pull me off the front lines. What does it matter if I die, bleeding a little for the homeland and for the suffering people of Korea, what is that compared to the cause? Friends, this is what I wanted to share with you, the precious journey of thought that our soldiers undergo on the Korean front, the invincible greatness of these heroes' hearts. This is the spark that ignites victory, even in the most brutal and challenging battles. Let us love our great homeland even more. For the people of China, who have achieved revolutionary victory, the word homeland is not an ordinary term, it is a name dear to our hearts, a noble name. What is the homeland? In the past, we have never been able to perfectly express it in a single sentence or a few words, and perhaps that is impossible. When people speak of the homeland, some may think of its hard-working, simple people, others may think of its majestic landscapes and brilliant culture, some may think of the red flag on Tiananmen Square, stained with the blood of countless martyrs, fluttering in the wind. Others might picture the factories joyfully bustling with progress, or the beautiful gardens filled with song. And of course, they may also think of one person, a figure who is both a father and a friend to them, thinking day and night about how to push the revolution forward, how to shield them from disaster, and how to bring them the happiness they deserve. This is their proud and wise leader, but no matter what someone envisions when they think of the homeland, they surely think of all these things. Homeland, you are the sum of all the victories won by the proletariat and the working masses of our country, under the leadership of Chairman Mao, through decades of arduous struggle and heroic sacrifice. You are the embodiment of all that is sacred and beautiful. To defend you is to defend the dictatorship of the proletariat. To protect you is to safeguard the future of socialism. To secure you is to ensure a brighter communist future. Therefore, homeland, you inspire people to live for you, to die for you, and to march forward with courage for your sake. March 21, 1951, late at night. Young people, make your youth more beautiful. Youth is beautiful, but one's youth can be ordinary and uneventful, or it can radiate the flames of heroism. Youth can be wasted and lead to regret, or it can be filled with steady steps toward a bright and magnificent adulthood. Young friends, I want to share with you how the young intellectuals, guided by Mao Zedong, have spent their youth on the Korean battlefield. Take, for example, Youth League member Dai Dubo. He was 24 years old, a high school student from Hunan, serving as a cultural instructor in a volunteer army company. His first battle was at Feihu Mountain. He was leading a stretcher team to rescue the wounded. 
As the troops charged up the steep mountain and engaged in fierce combat with the enemy, he stayed crouched at the foot of the mountain. At that moment, like anyone experiencing their first battle, he felt that every shell and bullet seemed to be aimed directly at him. But then he thought, asterisk, how can I be so afraid of war? Why am I just crouching here? Didn't I write in my letter of resolve that I would embrace the challenge and face any test? Asterisk. With that thought in mind, he stood up and started climbing the mountain. As he entered a small grove of trees, a shell suddenly exploded, striking a large tree and knocking it down. He crouched down again. At that moment, in the flickering red glow of the artillery fire, he saw a soldier tumble down from the hilltop. He didn't know if the soldier had been hit by a bullet or tripped on the rocks. But then, that same soldier immediately stood up again, raised a grenade high above his head, shouted something, and charged forward once more. Dai Dubo thought to himself, asterisk, why can't I do that, asterisk. So, he stood up again and climbed toward the front, leading his stretcher team. By the time he arrived, our forces had already taken the position. The company commander saw Dai coming and, with concern, asked, how are you, Dai Dubo? Is this your first time on the battlefield? Dai smiled and prepared to carry a wounded soldier down the hill. But the mountain was steep, and the path was narrow, it was impossible to carry the stretcher. Dai Dubo said, well then, let me carry him on my back. The company commander hesitated, wanting someone else to do it. But Dai, his face flushed with determination, said urgently, Commander, my letter of resolve wasn't written in vain. He said this and then lifted the wounded soldier onto his back. But as he descended the steep slope, it wasn't long before he was drenched in sweat, stumbling and barely able to move. Struggling to take a few more steps, he began to feel dizzy, his heart racing, mouth dry, legs weak and heavy as though they carried the weight of a thousand pounds with every step. He thought, asterisk, how can one person be this heavy? Maybe I should rest for a bit, asterisk. Just then, somehow, he must have jostled the wounded soldier, who let out a painful, ouch. That sound made him feel more guilty than the harshest reprimand. He steadied himself by grabbing onto a small tree, gathered his strength, faced the mountain, clutched the slope with his hands, clenched his teeth, and continued carrying the soldier down the hill. He finally managed to bring the wounded soldier to the aid station. When Dai Dubo headed back to the front lines for the second time, he no longer felt afraid. This time, he filled the soldiers' canteens with water, clanking as he carried them all on his back. The soldiers were overjoyed when they received their canteens, nearly jumping with excitement, grabbing his hands, laughing and cheering. Soon after, the enemy launched an attack, and everyone urged Dai to retreat. But he replied, no, I want to throw a grenade. As the enemy advanced, Dai Dubo, together with the soldiers, threw his very first grenade. This was no ordinary grenade, it was a symbol of the resolve of China's educated youth. It exploded in the face of the dark forces of the world, and young Dai Dubo himself heard the blast of that grenade. Afterwards, he said to someone, that was the happiest day of my life. Now, I'd also like to speak about the young women who participated. From the day they crossed the Yalu River, they carried a tremendous burden on their backs. Each woman had a backpack, 10 pounds of dry food, 10 pounds of rice, a small shovel, and some even carried a violin. One night, they marched 90 li, about 45 kilometers, and while some men fell behind, these women gritted their teeth, enduring blisters on their feet, and didn't lag behind at all. When they crossed the icy river, they rolled up their pants and waded through just like the men. The ice cut their legs, but they quietly bandaged themselves and didn't say a word. When they set up camp, they pitched a small tarp using pine branches on the mountainside and huddled together for warmth. If they woke up cold during the night, they would jump and hop around to warm up before sleeping again. By morning, their hair was covered in frost. The men teased them, saying, Hey, you don't even need makeup to play the white haired girl. The women would laugh back, Look at yourselves. Aren't you all white haired men? During the second campaign, Many of these women worked in field hospitals, providing care and earning honors for their efforts. One night, during a march, I found myself walking alongside a female comrade. She wasn't very tall, looked to be about 16 or 17. She had a sack of rations slung over her shoulder and carried an urhu. Her two small braids hung down from beneath her army cap, swaying with each step. She walked with a lively, light gait, softly humming a tune. I asked, are you from the cultural troupe? 
Yes, she replied and then told me she had just returned from the 1st Battalion, where her group had stayed for four days. As she spoke, she continued humming her song softly. I interrupted her and asked, what did you do during those four days? Well, she said, on the first day, we gathered stories of heroism. The second day, we wrote a performance, rehearsed on the third, and performed on the fourth. We just finished our last show before setting off. You see, I haven't even had time to wash off my makeup. She chuckled at that, and maybe worried I would see the grease paint on her face, she quickly grabbed a handful of snow and rubbed it across her face. I praised their efficient, combat-ready work style. She said, but it's pretty rough. But we just want to be useful, you know. Think about it, our soldiers don't have any time to spare. If we took forever perfecting our embroidery, how would that help? So, we go fast and keep things simple. No lights, we perform under the moon. No stage, we use the courtyard or the fields. While marching, we tell stories and sing to the soldiers as they walk. We're against just putting on a show in the woods. You've done quite a bit of artistic work. I said, it's not just art, we do whatever needs to be done, whatever we come across. I've even worked as a cook. A cook, yeah, frontline cooks are super busy. They deliver meals, water, and even ammunition. When I saw they were struggling to keep up, I volunteered to help. And also, also what? I asked. I served as a platoon leader in a POW camp for two months. I looked at her small frame and the childlike way she spoke and couldn't help but laugh. Why are you laughing? She said seriously. Don't be fooled by their size. Do you think those tall prisoners dared to disobey my orders? When I told them to stand, they didn't dare sit. I stifled my laughter, keeping it to myself. Just then, the whistle blew, signaling arrest. In an instant, she disappeared from sight. Moments later, I heard her voice, clear and lively, calling from a rocky ledge nearby. Comrades, shall we sing a song? Everyone below shouted in unison, yes. The song began. Under the glare of enemy searchlights across the Han River, she gracefully waved her arms, keeping time with the music. After the song ended, she came over carrying two buckets of water she had scooped from a small river. She handed one to me, and with the other, she drank deeply, gulping it down in one go. After drinking, she put her hands behind her head and lay back to rest, her braids falling onto the snow-covered ground. I couldn't help but reflect, six months or maybe a year ago, these young women were still untrained students, just regular kids in front of their parents. And now, here they were, only a few miles from the front line, so calm and joyful, working in the most intense and dangerous battlefield in the world. How admirable that transformation was. I couldn't help but express my admiration. Comrade, your progress has been so rapid. Well, that's thanks to the party's education, but it also depends on one's own determination. But what exactly is your determination? Me. She smiled shyly, looking down at her feet and not saying anything for a moment. After a pause, she continued, pretty much the same as everyone else's. So, is your goal to join the party? She smiled but didn't answer directly. At that moment, the whistle blew again, signaling the troops to move forward. She shook the snow from her hair, and we continued walking together. There's another reason why we've progressed so quickly, she said. We spend a lot of time with the soldiers, with heroes, and being around them makes us braver too. She spoke with enthusiasm, recounting how, at the beginning of the deployment, she felt like she couldn't carry all her gear. But when she saw the soldiers carrying even heavier loads and still walking while reciting rhymed slogans, she found herself walking more easily. When enemy planes fired flares, she was initially frightened. But the soldiers said, look, they've lit lanterns for us, it's great for walking. And she felt less afraid. Once, while tending to wounded soldiers, she noticed that most of them were cheerful, except for one soldier who had fought south of the 38th parallel but seemed downcast. She asked him why he wasn't happy, and he said, Ah, comrade, I'm not upset about shedding some blood. It's just that I feel I should have been wounded south of the 38th parallel, not north of it. Another time, she was at the front lines during an intense bombardment. She noticed a few soldiers calmly stitching their shoes as the enemy's artillery rained down around them. Astonished, she wondered why they were focusing on such a trivial task amid the chaos. When she asked, the soldiers smiled and said, if we don't mend our shoes now, how will we chase the enemy once they retreat? As she shared this, she looked at me with admiration and said, you see, aren't our soldiers heroes? Even after they're wounded, 
they still think about advancing, and during the enemy's heaviest bombardments, they're preparing for pursuit. How could we not become braver around such heroes? One day, we too will. You too will what? I pressed. We too will, she trailed off, giggling shyly, as if finding it hard to say aloud. Go on, say it. I encouraged. We too will become like them, she finally blurted out, revealing the beautiful secret she held in her heart. She then kicked a small stone with determination and raised her head. Even in the dark night, I could see the sparks of youth and ambition shining in her eyes. With conviction, she said, do you think that's impossible? It's possible, of course it is, I quickly replied, nodding in agreement. It's certain that we can do it, she said with conviction and seriousness. Of course, we're still very young, and we don't know much yet. We've grown up in peaceful times, and we haven't faced any strict trials or challenges. That's exactly why I need to put myself through the fire, to see if I'm truly made of steel. When the older comrades talk about the harsh struggles and heroic deeds of their time, I'm so drawn in. It captures my heart entirely. I always wonder, when will I become like them? When will I be able to contribute something to my country? I think to myself, how did they make it through? They were so great, so amazing. That kind of life is so meaningful. And now, I'm also living that life, so how could I not feel happy? Our old regiment commander always sees me skipping around and says, what's that little yellow-haired girl so happy about all the time? Well, this is exactly what I'm happy about. Young friends, this is how they spend their youth, blending with the workers and peasants and immersing themselves in the heat of struggle. This is a joyful youth, a beautiful youth, a heroic youth. In Mao Zedong's era, who wouldn't want to experience such a youth? Friends, Youth League members, I know you admire proletarian heroes like Lu Hulan and Dong Kunrui. You often talk about them and ask yourselves, could I become someone like that? It's clear how much you look up to revolutionary heroes, how much your young lives burn with the desire to ignite with the flames of heroism. And now, the young people on the Korean battlefield have already set a shining example for you. As you read these stories of heroism, I want to remind you, six months or a year ago, they were just like you. If they can do it, you can too. Friends, strive to become brave warriors who serve the people of China and the world with all your heart. There is no greater honor than that. Let thousands upon thousands of positions be filled with warriors like this. Let the revolutionary heroism of our great motherland bloom everywhere. May 6, 1951. Hash 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 winter and spring. Spring has come to the front lines in Korea, where the forces of light and darkness clash. Over the past winter, the Chinese and Korean people's armies fought shoulder to shoulder, defeating the world's number one dying enemy, U.S. Imperialism, they tore through the paper tiger's skin and shattered the myth of America's invincibility. But for the people, this difficult yet victorious path is just a preparation for even greater triumphs ahead. The fruitful winter is nurturing an even more glorious spring. Let me illustrate this with the words of a commander. One evening, I sat in a small room with a regimental commander. The breeze coming through the window carried the scent of spring. We began to talk at length. You ask me about the gains our troops made during the winter campaigns. Well, they were quite substantial, he said excitedly. Then, pointing to an electric firing carbine hanging on the wall, he continued, first of all, let's talk about the most obvious gain. This new carbine, it's a model the Americans only began using in the Korean War. But from the moment they came into contact with us, they started handing them over in droves. Now, the cannons we've captured from the enemy are lined up alongside our own artillery. I think it's quite satisfying that we can turn their own weapons against them. Don't you think our firepower will be even stronger in future battles? Secondly, something even more valuable is how, through fighting a modern equipped enemy, we've enriched ourselves and improved. I'd like to emphasize this point, he said, with a sense of urgency. Maybe it's more obvious for me personally. Among the cadres of the various regiments, I'm the youngest. So over the past few months, my brain hasn't had a single moment of real rest. I've been completely immersed in learning through combat. Now, I feel like I've improved. What I've gained might even be more than what I would have learned in several years of military school, and it feels even more personal to me. With each battle, I've felt more confident in my command. This kind of gain is precious, maybe something most people won't fully understand, but for a commander, it's like a farmer seeing his granary full to the brim. It's pure joy. At this point, he suddenly let out a hearty laugh and said, isn't it strange? 
These last few campaigns seemed almost as if they were designed to train us in every aspect. The first and second campaigns trained us in maneuver warfare, the third campaign trained us in assault tactics, and the fourth campaign brought us defensive operations. Our tactical superiority has already astonished the enemy, and I think we'll surprise them even more in the future. At this, he grew even more excited, and a strange smile spread across his face, the kind of smile only a commander wears after a hard-fought victory. He went on, there are tangible gains, like the carbine and the mortars I mentioned earlier, things you can see. But then there are the intangible gains, things you can't immediately see, like the transformation in people's thoughts and willpower. But you must never underestimate the power of these intangible things. When the cannons start firing, you'll see that this kind of strength is incredible. It's one of the key factors that determines the outcome of a war. This time, as we went into battle across the border, I feel that every one of our troops read two important textbooks. One was the textbook of determination, and the other was the textbook of confidence. As soon as we crossed the Yalu River, our comrades first read the textbook of determination. This textbook was written for us by the American invaders with their bombs, incendiaries, and the blood of the Korean people. After we crossed the Yalu, seeing the rubble, the devastated Korean people, every single one of us not only came to understand the true face of US imperialism but also learned what it's made of, deep down. When the words, American imperialism, are mentioned, you can see the burning hatred in everyone's eyes. We understood the suffering of the Korean people today, and we also understood the threat to our own homeland. He paused for a moment, letting the weight of his words sink in, before continuing. We have grown to love our country and the fraternal Korean people even more. This textbook has made us willing to give our lives, as long as we can defeat the invaders. Moreover, after these four campaigns, bolstered by our determination, we have emerged victorious every time. Through this, we have also studied another textbook, the Textbook of Confidence. This textbook of confidence tells us that the American invaders and their lackeys can indeed be defeated. Despite their superior equipment and dominance of the sea and air, they can still be beaten. These two textbooks were not written in ink but in blood. We have already defeated a better equipped enemy under challenging conditions. With improvements in our equipment and continued advancements in tactics and techniques, we are certain to achieve even greater victories and bury the American invaders and their lackeys on the Korean peninsula. When he finished speaking, he became very serious, pausing for several minutes. In addition, I believe there is another significant achievement on our side, he said. That is the increasingly solid and profound friendship between the Chinese and Korean people. This unity has transcended ordinary words and is something that no force can divide. I often think that for the people of one country to be so close to the people of another country is a rare occurrence in history. I hope you won't underestimate this factor it is another key to defeating the enemy. That's my view. As our conversation came to a close, a firm voice called from outside. Report. The regimental commander straightened up and said, come in. The rain curtain lifted, and the messenger delivered two letters. The commander immediately opened them. As he read, he smiled to himself and muttered, two more. Two more. What? I asked. Requests to take on the main assault in the next campaign. He set the letters on the table. Spring has come, and every commander's desk is filled with such requests, requests for larger battles, requests for greater victories. These are springtime requests. If you visit the companies, you'll see the soldiers bustling like swallows, sharpening bayonets, polishing newly captured weapons, mending worn-out clothes, writing new plans for meritorious deeds, or sitting on hillsides alone, penning applications to join the party or the youth league. All of this shows that spring has arrived at the front lines of the global battle between light and darkness. This spring will surely be a season of jubilation for the people of our country and Korea, but for the enemy, it will be a terrible spring. For we have reaped a bountiful winter, how could we not have a glorious spring? April 2, 1951. Hash 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 forward, motherland. Forward, motherland. Amid the sounds of artillery fire, the humble chestnut blossoms once again fell across Korea. This was the third year of the Korean War. Friends, you must be envious of me, for here, I once again witness our beloved soldiers. They have been away from their beloved homeland for two years now. In these two years, how much hardship they have endured. Two years may not seem long, but I've seen many commanders with new wrinkles on their foreheads, and some have streaks of grey hair at their temples. The soldiers, thousands and thousands of them, have thick, calloused hands. 
With those hands, they've carved and tunneled through the mountains from the east coast to the west, creating an intricate underground fortress like a spider's web. They stand upon this great wall, fighting and tormenting the beasts that have not yet been completely wiped out. And from this great wall, they look back to the north, their homeland. For a soldier who has been away from home for two years, how deeply he yearns for his homeland. When they talk about home, of course, they miss their mothers, their wives, and their friends. But even more, they passionately discuss one thing, something everyone is talking about, something that echoes through every smoke-filled trench. They all talk about a captivating word, asterisk the construction of their homeland. You can see it in many commanders' quarters, where beside a vase of wildflowers and near their military maps, are colored photographs of labor heroes, pictures of the Huai River flood control project, and images of the Chengdu Chongqing Railway inauguration. In the soldiers' shelters, you also find these images smiling children, the first tractors appearing in the country's agricultural cooperatives, and factories belching smoke. Even on the bodies of those who have gloriously sacrificed for the homeland and the Korean people, there are these same pictures, stained red with blood alongside their letters of determination. The homeland is advancing, the rapid construction of the homeland is stirring the hearts of those fighting for her abroad. The homeland, on this battlefield where artillery fills the sky, everyone is thinking of you, everyone is listening for you, even guessing about you from a simple letter from home. Though they cannot see you, it is as if they can hear you, for your swift steps of progress are resonating in the hearts of your sons and daughters. You have amazed many soldiers when they received new guns and ammunition. You have made countless soldiers spread the word about each of your achievements. And you have kept many soldiers smiling for days after reading letters from home, smiles that linger, so deeply moving. Distant homeland asterisk, do you know? Do you know how your rapid progress stirs the hearts of those who have taken up arms for you? During a patriotic education session in a certain company, a soldier stood up and said, Report, instructor. I have two things to say to everyone. After receiving permission, the soldier walked to the front of the unit, pulling out two letters and a photo from his pocket. His eyes filled with tears, and with a trembling, hoarse voice, he held the photo high for all to see. He said, This is a photo of my sister. What do you think, isn't she beautiful? Everyone looked, and it was indeed a picture of a young girl, healthy and pretty, with bright eyes, and her hair tied into two braids, each with a butterfly-shaped ribbon. Comrades, but she wasn't always like this. The soldier looked at them and continued, thinking aloud as he spoke. She used to work as a servant for a landlord's family. Her whole body was covered in bruises, her hair tied in a thin, scraggly braid, and her face was yellow and sickly. She would cry and run back home every other day. Our parents left us behind, and I couldn't even take care of my own sister. All we could do was cry by our grandmother's side, cry by our uncle's side, but what could they do? As he said this, tears started to roll down his face. He continued, I stomped my feet and left home all those years ago, never imagining that my sister would still be alive. But the homeland has changed, and so has my hometown. The letter says that a factory has been built near our home and she's already working there as a laborer. My grandmother and uncle were given land and joined a mutual aid team. Who knows, in a few more years, maybe even big tractors will be working the fields near us. She even wrote that I should keep fighting hard on the front lines while she works hard back home, and that we should compete to see who can do better. Look at how happy she looks in this picture. The comrades all stared at the photo again, looking at the girl with butterfly ribbons in her braids. The soldier, as if asking everyone, said, Comrades, what do you think is going on here? These days, when I go into battle, my legs just seem to move forward on their own. When I work, I feel like there's never enough time. I've smashed iron hammers into round lumps, worn down long picks into spindle-shaped tools, but me. I don't feel tired, and I don't feel sleepy. The more I think about it, the happier I get, and the harder I work. You wouldn't believe how much energy I have. This is the story of an ordinary soldier's family transformation, and it's the story of thousands of other ordinary soldiers' families. The great development in the homeland in recent years has inspired so much hope in people. If, when our soldiers crossed the Yalu River, it was the inhumane destruction wrought by American invaders on Korea, the ruins, the blood, and the fire, that awakened and enraged them, driving them to fight fearlessly to defend the homeland, then today, their bodies are filled with new, boundless strength.
That strength comes from the construction of the homeland, the ever-increasing beauty of the country, and the new, captivating sights that attract and ignite the hearts of people. Truly, it sets their hearts on fire. When the news of the Chengdu Chongqing Railway's completion reached the Korean battlefield, it especially stirred the Sichuanese soldiers. Soldiers who were marching started to dance the Yanko, and those on the front lines clapped their rifles and sang folk songs from their hometowns. One soldier, whose home was right next to the Chengdu Chongqing Railway, spoke with deep emotion, in front of my house, there's a small river. As a child, when I would go gather firewood or grass, I'd always see two small wooden stakes on either side of the river. I remember people saying that this was where the Chengdu Chongqing Railway was going to be built. But as he grew up, more than 20 years passed. The small wooden stakes had long since rotted away, and his father had died a painful death, forced to work on the road. Yet, no one ever saw any sign of the Chengdu Chongqing Railway. He said, who would have thought that less than three years after liberation, the Chengdu Chongqing Railway would finally be completed. Now, I often dream of a sturdy and beautiful iron bridge spanning the small river in front of my house, with trains puffing smoke as they chug along and my mother is standing there in new clothes, watching the train go by. Another soldier from Sichuan chimed in, isn't that true? I had a similar dream. I dreamed I was sitting on one of the country's trains, and somehow, after a lot of twists and turns, we ended up on the Chengdu Chongqing Railway. I looked around and, wow, it was amazing. The Chengdu Chongqing Railway was more beautiful than any other railway. The train chugged along until it stopped at a station 40 miles from my house. Looking out the window, I couldn't believe my eyes. When I left, this place was just a barren field where workers were still clearing grass, but now there were rows and rows of identical three-story buildings. The factory chimneys stood like a forest, all puffing out smoke. And over there, there was even an airfield, packed with gleaming white fighter planes. How beautiful my hometown had become. As I was staring, someone said to me, what are you standing around for, just staring? You're almost home, get off the train. I got off and saw that all the relatives and friends who had seen me off when I enlisted were there to welcome me back. Just as I was about to pick up my backpack and walk, one of my relatives said, Silly boy, why don't you take a car? I replied, When I left, it was all narrow paths, with big rocks tripping you up, how could a car get through? My relative said, If they can build something as difficult as the Chengdu Chongqing Railway, do you think they haven't built a road to? Get in the car, it'll take you all the way to your doorstep. I was so happy to climb into a bright red car, just about to leave, when I heard someone shout, get back to your post. I opened my eyes and saw it was our squad leader. This was a dream, but it wasn't just a dream, it was a glimpse of the homeland's true beauty as it marches forward. Even in their dreams, after enduring the hardships of battle, our soldiers long to paint pictures of their homeland, of the beauty of their hometowns now and in the future. One day, as I walked along a trench toward a company's position, I heard heavy hammering sounds coming from a row of dugouts ahead, along with the rhythmic chants of Ha Yo. Ha Yo. I could also hear two voices taking turns singing out. I'll add another brick. I'll add another tile. I'll add another screw. I'll add another chimney. I followed the sound and entered a dugout, where I saw two soldiers working hard, drilling into solid rock. One soldier was holding the drill, his hands cracked and bleeding from the vibrations, blood soaking into the cracks. The other was swinging a heavy hammer, his shirt drenched in sweat, with droplets falling from his chin to the ground. They were using pine wood for light to save oil, and the smoke had blackened their faces and clothes. Yet, despite their exhaustion, they were cheerfully calling out to each other, taking turns shouting a line. I asked, comrades, where are you adding a brick or a tile? For Mao Zedong City. Mao Zedong City, yes, the hammer-wielding soldier paused, wiped his sweat, and said, Comrade, haven't you heard? In our homeland, they're planning to build a city called Mao Zedong City. It will connect several cities, spanning hundreds of miles. The chimneys in the city will be as dense as the forests on these mountains. The streets will be over 80 meters wide, wide enough for 40 cars to drive side by side. Bigger than Beijing, no. It's wide enough for 48 cars to drive side by side. This city is even bigger than what you just said. The soldier holding the drill corrected him. The soldier with the hammer looked at me with shining eyes and continued, Comrade, imagine how great it would be when Mao Zedong city is built. It will probably be the most beautiful city ever. What an honor it would be to lay just one brick or add one tile to it. 
As we were hammering away here, we got so excited that we felt like we were building Mao Zedong City ourselves. That's why we started chanting and singing. After saying this, the young soldier took off his sweat-soaked shirt, wrung it out with his hands, then shook it out in the breeze at the entrance before putting it back on. He shouted, buddy, let's get back to it, and immediately raised the eight-pound hammer again. Though the construction of Mao Zedong City was just a legend and a fantasy among the soldiers, it was born out of their deep love for Chairman Mao and their boundless concern for the construction of their homeland. Oh, homeland, can you tell me how wide, how far, and how beautiful your future roads will be? How greatly you attract and inspire the hearts of the people. Whenever the newly made weapons from the homeland arrived at the Korean front lines, they sparked joy and affection among the soldiers. A young division commander, upon hearing that a recoilless gun made in the homeland had arrived, immediately called his staff officer, saying, quick, make sure they bring one over so I can take a look. When the gun was set up at his doorstep, he was seen softly caressing its shiny black barrel, just as he used to stroke his warhorse. He lowered his head, gazing at it for several minutes, before gently covering it with its protective sleeve and having it carried away. As the gun was taken away, he watched it go and muttered to himself, if only my little Lingzi was still alive, I'd give him this gun. No tank could stand against it. People told me that Lingzi had been his messenger for many years. If he was still alive, he would be 19 this year, the youngest and most beloved of all the messengers. During one of the five campaigns, enemy tanks were closing in on the division command post. The guard platoon opened fire on the tanks, but machine guns, rifles, and all available firepower couldn't stop their advance. In a fit of desperation, Lingzi grabbed two grenades and charged forward. Like a little swallow, he climbed onto the top of a tank. He first tried to wedge a grenade into the tank's tracks, but it rolled off and exploded, injuring him. Blood streamed down his face as he tried to open the tank's hatch to throw the grenade inside, but he couldn't get it open. Everyone watching was so anxious that their cotton-padded jackets were soaked with sweat. According to what the division commander later told others, at that moment, while watching his little Lingzi, he wished he could bite the tank's hatch open himself, so Lingzi could throw the grenade inside. Eventually, the hatch was opened from the inside, and a handgun appeared, firing several shots into Lingzi's chest. Despite being shot several times in the chest, Lingzi forced the grenade into the tank, destroying it. But Lingzi also fell, lying lifeless on top of the tank. It was then that I truly understood why the commander was so deeply moved by the new, advanced artillery the homeland had produced. When I spoke to the commander about this, he sighed and said, I'm in my thirties now, and half of my life has been spent in war. Over the years, I can confidently say that no enemy, in terms of courage, endurance, or ability to learn from combat experience, can surpass us. The American devils are even worse. But we have been lacking in one thing, modern equipment. If an army like ours, with soldiers like Lingzi, had fully modernized equipment, you can't imagine how powerful we would be. So many soldiers have said, we don't even need equipment superior to the enemies. If we just had equipment on par with theirs, we could set a date and drive them into the sea. He paused, then continued, but isn't the opposite also true? The enemy dares to act so viciously and arrogantly precisely because we don't yet have a strong industrial base or sufficient modern equipment. They believe we are still inferior in this regard. However, now the construction of our homeland is progressing rapidly, and large-scale economic development is about to begin. Whenever I receive a piece of artillery, even if it's just a handgun, I find it so precious. This isn't just a gun or a cannon, it's the entire homeland advancing into a new era of history. A few days later, one evening, I went to see the commander again. Under the lamplight, he was resting his chin on his hand, smiling as he listened to the staff officer report on the initial success of the recoilless gun. That day's fierce anti-tank battle had destroyed 18 of the more than 30 enemy tanks that had been deployed. The staff officer excitedly added that one gunner had destroyed five tanks on his own. According to the report from the company, when this soldier was about to fire, several tank shells exploded near him, injuring him and knocking him into the trench. Despite being wounded, he propped himself up on the recoilless gun's tripod, looked at his weapon, and called out softly to his wounded comrade, this is a new gun from our homeland. We haven't even destroyed a single tank yet. Can we just leave like this? No, we owe it to the workers who made this gun. He went on to destroy five tanks while bleeding, without even stopping to bandage his wounds. 
Later, when the instructor approached him to write a commendation for his bravery, the soldier said, Instructor, you shouldn't give me the credit first. You should give it to someone else first. The instructor asked, Who should I give it to? The soldier replied, To whom? To the workers who built this gun. This gun works so well, at least half of the credit should go to them, and the other half to me. Afterward, the soldier kept asking where the gun was made because he wanted to write a letter to thank the workers. When the commander heard this, he couldn't help but smile, nodding as he said, Do you think this gun was made by just a few people? You should thank all the workers of the homeland. In the future, they will put wings on these little, tiger cubs, one by one. Friends of the homeland, elders of the homeland. From summer to autumn, the countless soldiers I've met on the Korean battlefield have all asked me to convey their deep gratitude to you. Before the Imjin River thawed, you sent them single layer clothing. As soon as the autumn wind started blowing, they received warm winter garments. The elderly mothers, with tears in their eyes, donated their lifelong savings. Children who had just learned to write address their letters, calling them Uncle Volunteer Soldier. How deeply moving this is. What they are especially grateful for is that during the two years they've been away from home, just two years, you have made the homeland, their home, so beautiful. They know how hard you've worked. They know how diligently you've labored beside machines, in the mines, on the fields, in the forests, and in the remote, desolate mountains. Therefore, they also understand how precious the beautiful scene unfolding from your hands is, and they know what it takes to defend it and why it is worth defending. They also ask me to tell you this. They have no mysterious requests for the homeland, only concern for the country's production and construction. If you believe your sons and daughters are brave, then rest assured, pour all your efforts into building the nation. They will make sure to hold the underground Great Wall at the 38th parallel. They proudly call themselves the Sentinels of the 38th parallel, standing guard for the homeland, for Korea, for Asia, and for the entire world, until they complete their duty as Sentinels to the fullest. They will also not waste a single minute or second as they push the enemy, squeeze the enemy, and torment the enemy, relentlessly driving the front lines forward. They understand that every inch they push forward moves war and disaster an inch farther from the homeland, every hill they capture adds one more hill for the Korean people to farm and live happily on. The artillery fire at the 38th parallel will be farther away from our happy children, our singing machines, and our flourishing crops. Fathers and elders of the homeland, you love your children so dearly. If you want to know the voices and wishes of the volunteer army, these are their voices, these are their wishes. Oh, homeland, our homeland, guided by our infallible leader, our homeland with 50 million patriotic hearts burning and boiling with passion, your grand scale economic construction is about to begin. You will grow more lovable day by day, more lovable moment by moment. No one knows the full extent of your power, and no one can imagine how beautiful, vast, and boundless your future will be. To serve such a homeland, to serve a homeland that bravely upholds the flag of internationalism, is so joyful, so proud, and even the spilling of blood is so glorious. Friends, friends of the homeland, the powerful call of Chairman Mao echoes in our ears. The time that soldiers have won with their blood and lives is so precious. As this great signal for construction is sent out, how will you rise to meet the new historical tasks of our homeland? For two years, from the homeland to Korea, I have witnessed a blazing construction effort on one side, and on the other, a fearless battle amidst the overwhelming roar of artillery. It feels as if there are two parallel battlefields, advancing together. Let these two battlefields inspire and compete with one another, pushing our homeland forward. The sons and daughters in Korea will offer continuous victories to the people of the homeland, and to the people of the homeland, especially the workers, we ask that you greet the soldiers who will one day return victorious in the morning, with a homeland as beautiful as a garden. Written in October 1952 on the west coast of Korea. Squeeze it to collapse. Part 1. The morning fog was heavy, and the chestnut trees covering the mountains dripped with moisture. Through the thick fog, the political commissar and I sat in a small jeep, heading toward the forward command post. Last night, he told me they were organizing a small battle, set to start tonight. That's why I was here. The jeep sped along the narrow mountain road like an excited young calf, crossing rushing streams and passing green hills. Before long, our clothes were dampened by the mist. The jeep stopped at the foot of a steep slope. The political commissar pointed and said, this is it. We got out of the car and began to climb. The grass was thick, and the dew was heavy, with clusters of small pine trees that were partly green and partly yellow. 
The political commissar explained that these trees had been burned by enemy incendiary bombs last year, and the grass had only grown back this year. As we turned into a denser patch of trees, we heard a loud voice from the other side of the grove. Tell them to come out and explain themselves. Why did they wound one of my men for no reason? After that voice, another, lower one responded, I've told them to submit a review report tonight. Make sure it's a thorough review, the loud voice insisted. They must learn a lesson. Have the report on my desk by five o'clock this afternoon. From the voice alone, I knew it was our young division commander. Although I hadn't seen him in a few years, he was an old friend of mine. As we stepped out of the small grove, we saw a small house built against a cliff. In front of it was a flat area about the size of a Kang mat. The commander was standing there with a staff officer. Hearing our footsteps, the commander turned around quickly. Ah, oh, you've arrived, he called warmly, and we hurried over to shake hands with him. He looked at me and smiled, I heard you were coming. I studied him closely, he was as clean and tidy as ever, maintaining the habits and demeanor of a soldier. But his face had aged. There were a few more wrinkles on his forehead, and his eyes were bloodshot, filled with a depth that suggested he spent his days in deep thought. We set a few wooden stools down and sat. The guards brought us tea. I looked at the commander and asked, how's your health? His bloodshot eyes twinkled as he smiled and said, when it comes to climbing mountains and surveying terrain, none of the regiment commanders here can keep up with me. The political commissar then added, in that regard, he really can boast a bit. Everyone in our division calls him, Mountain Climbing Tiger. The staff officer standing nearby interjected with a note of disagreement, last night, while out for a walk, he suddenly fainted right where we're sitting now. It was the sentry who found him and carried him into the house. He didn't wake up for quite a while. The commander immediately protested, brushing it off, that was just due to lack of sleep. It's nothing serious. Pointing at the young staff officer, he said, don't think you're young, by the time you're my age, who knows how you'll hold up. I've been grinding away in Korea for so long, and the American devils still haven't worn me down. Don't expose my weaknesses. Now, bring the map. The staff officer brought the map over, and the commander spread it out on the ground, moving his stool forward. He glanced at the political commissar and then at me, saying, let me first explain the specific deployment for this battle. Later, I'll need to hold a meeting with the artillery unit. Today, the enemy's planes and tanks won't pose much of a problem for us. However, dealing with their artillery, countering their guns, is going to require some serious thought. Without realizing it, he took off his hat and placed it on his knee. It was then that I noticed his bald head, which was beginning to thin at the top. He absent-mindedly scratched at his sparse hair, as if trying to pull out some elusive idea. After a brief pause, he seemed to pull his thoughts back from deep contemplation. Pointing to the enemy's front line on the map, he said, Tonight, I'm taking this position. They won't be able to stop me from getting a foothold here. After explaining the deployment of troops and firepower, he looked up. There was a glint of fire deep in his eyes, but he wasn't looking at anyone, just at a branch of a pine tree above him. He added, this is the reality of the Korean War today. If you don't want to resolve things fairly and reasonably, I'll just keep pushing forward. If I can't swallow you in one bite, I'll take you bit by bit. For every one I kill, there's one less of you. You drag things out at the negotiation table in Panmunjom, and I'll grind you down here. We'll squeeze you to collapse. Just as he was about to fold up the map, another, younger staff officer came from the operations room and reported that at dawn, the enemy had attacked one of our platoons, but we had killed more than a dozen of their soldiers. Now, the enemy was retrieving their dead. The commander immediately fixed his gaze on the staff officer and asked, So, what did you instruct the troops to do? The staff officer, as if afraid of being reprimanded, blinked his youthful eyes but didn't say anything, because, in truth, he hadn't given any instructions. The commander stood up, causing the hat on his knee to fall to the ground, and said, tell the troops to give the enemy a lesson. But the enemy is using smoke screens. Smoke screens. Then fire into the smoke. Use the 60mm mortars. The staff officer acknowledged the order and turned to leave, but the commander called him back, Tell the regimental commander not to let the enemy casually carry away the dead. Organize firepower to give them a lesson. If they carry one away, make sure they lose another. This isn't some free travel zone in the middle of Shanghai. We're not going to let these guests wander around as they please. He sat back down, folded up the map, 
and handed it to the staff officer, who left with it. Then, he picked up his hat, dusted it off, and said, these guys, a few months ago, they were acting so wild. Every day they'd launch attacks, and that's not even the worst part, right in front of our positions, they'd be dancing with women. And now, go take a look if you want. I've already seen it, crawling on their bellies across the battlefield with their butts sticking up in the air, like dogs. They've turned into vermin, ha ha ha, he burst into hearty laughter, and the political commissar couldn't help but join in. By now, everyone had gathered for the artillery meeting. The political commissar was about to get busy with other tasks, so I quickly took the opportunity to follow him to his quarters. As we walked, a series of booming explosions echoed through the air, enemy shells hitting the base of the mountain, with greyish-blue smoke slowly rising. The thick fog had lifted from the ground, merging with the clouds at the mountain peaks. Looking east, I could see the sun had already risen, casting a reddish glow over the ridges. Part 2 The political commissar's dugout was about the size of an ordinary room, with newspapers pasted neatly on the walls. A mosquito net hung over the bed, and on the wall next to the desk was a portrait of Chairman Mao. A bouquet of golden red wild lilies, commonly found in the Korean country,